I want you to keep an eye on her. For what, Jack? She don't do anything wrong. I want you to keep an eye on her while I'm away, right? If you start trouble for nothing, I'm telling you, you're cracking up. Hey, Joe, I got a reason, right? You and I won't know any woman given the right time, the right place, the right circumstance. They do anything, right? Yeah. I mean, anything's possible. Yeah. All right? Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where we are continuing our exploration of Raging Bull. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a writer, producer, and host uh, and voiceover artist in San Diego, California. And before we get started, we just want to announce this is, you know, a big announcement and we want to keep plugging it that we are now duplicating many of the features on our Patreon feed through an Apple podcast subscription. So if you're not into the Patreon thing, you don't feel like giving them your credit card information or stuff like that, and you are a frequent user of Apple products, you will be able to get our entire catalog of episodes ad free as well as our entire catalog of cinephile shorts, which have previously only been available on Patreon. Now, we're in the process of loading all these things up. Not everything is there right now. All of our films from this year are available ad-free, and our first 75 films, that's the first two years of The Cinephiles, are also available ad-free, and we are going to be loading everything else up, including the shorts, over the next couple of months. And this is just a a $4.99 subscription or $49.99 a year, Mm -hmm. and that is to get access to all this. So if you wanted to support the show, if you don't like listening to ads and you want to hear all these cinephile shorts that you've been missing out, just go to Apple Podcasts and with one click, you can subscribe to the show. Yeah, and a lot of people have reached out to us privately and on DMs telling us how they're not 100% comfortable with uh, with, uh, going the Patreon route, which is totally understandable. Everyone's got their own way of doing things, like everyone's got their preferred choice for podcast platform to listen to podcasts you know there's numerous ones out there for people to use so we thought we'd explore the idea of apple uh, tv because some people have suggested that or apple rather has some people have suggested that as well so we hope that this is a way for some of you who have had trepidation about patreon who feel much more comfortable with apple to go that route to uh, support the show with a monthly subscription or a yearly subscription um we'd love to have you so there you go And to be clear, this isn't taking anything away from Patreon. We're still very active there. We're posting all the time. And of course, there are additional tiers on Patreon where you can get combined episodes. You can listen to our watch alongs, which are exclusive to Patreon. And of course, join our advisory board and help plot the future of the cinephiles. So there's still tons of stuff for you to enjoy at patreon.com slash the cinephiles. For sure. For sure. Um, it's always funny, John, whenever we yeah. take these breaks, you know, between recordings, cause then I, I, I think more about the movie and me here's too. The, the thought no. that hit me, uh, before we jump into things is that yeah. I don't, there, there've been anti-heroes in film before mm. there've been dark characters. There've been evil characters who are the main characters of film. I don't know if there's ever been anyone like Jake LaMotta on film before mm. this movie. And I, what's interesting to me is it's like. It's take, taking this guy who I, is not a person that I like, mm-hmm. and it is not a, you know, it's like there are all sorts of evil characters that I'm fascinated by. Mm-hmm. That's not what Jake LaMotta is. Jake LaMotta is this very real, human, difficult person, and what Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro are saying is it's saying this person is also worth your time. This person yeah. is worth it for you to spend a couple of hours with. And I don't know that we'd ever seen that on film before. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as I think I was alluding to in one of our shorts, which are coming up, um, uh, because we recorded them before we recorded this episode, I think this is the last 1970s movie. And I know it's 1980, but this is like the last gasp of the 1970s, this film. And oh, yeah. I kind of love that, along with Thief and maybe a couple other ones that kind of cross that line in, into 1980 and barely 1981. I think this is one of the last ones, if not the last 1970s film. And this is the ultimately, this is the ultimate seventies protagonist to the nth degree. And by that, I mean, this is a guy who is pretty brutal, um, pretty tough to watch at times, but, but it's being acted by one of the best actors ever in an Oscar winning performance. And to be honest with you, watching it again, after all these years, and we'll get to the sections that I'm going to be talking about here later on in our discussion, maybe in the third part, because I imagine we're going through part. <laughs> yeah. um, he doesn't really learn the lesson that we think he learns by the time the movie is over. He forces a reconciliation with Joey. He never reconciles with his wife fully. 
And he just ends up a sad sack playing these strip clubs and uh, small bars and whatever in New York City just to stay alive. So in a way, I think beyond what you're saying that it's this guy has some value to watch, I think it's a cautionary tale of where our lives can go and that not everyone in the movies and in real life gets to have this kind of resolution that you think they deserve and that sometimes you a leopard can't change his spots but he can certainly smooth his spots over a little bit just to be palatable and as you said here like you took some time uh, between this to kind of think about things more i dove into excerpts from vicky lamada's book and i was oh. reading some excerpts from Vicky Lamata's book. And I was reading about some of the interactions that Scorsese and De Niro had with Jake Lamata. It wasn't all peachy keen. Uh, and according to Vicky, like they didn't like Jake coming to the set. Jake was making an annoyance of himself a lot of the time when they weren't using him to teach uh, De Niro how to fight. Um, and he kept going, Jake did, in trying to win Vicky back even as the film was being made. Wow. So 20 years later... He still hadn't learned his lesson. And Vicky says in her book very clearly that he vacillated between being uh, a jerk off who was constantly wanting his way and the sweet guy we see in the movie, the, the combo of both. Uh, and so he didn't really learn the lesson that he should have learned. He may have smoothed his edges a little bit, but this isn't someone you should be admiring by the end of the movie. And as you read more and more about Jake LaMotta after the movie, he's still not someone you should be admiring. But that doesn't mean his life isn't worth value and it doesn't have something to teach us as we watch this movie and the way it progresses uh, when it comes to paranoia and um, feelings of insecurity and low self-worth and anger, you know? This is why I love doing the show with you. And, and, and I'm, I, you know, I'm so glad you took a look at uh, Vicky's story and at her book. Cause I haven't looked at any of that. That is fascinating to me. And it was so yeah. funny as you were speaking, it was like the moment before you were coming to your point. Yeah. I, I understood it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that, that I went like, oh yeah, because life isn't a fucking movie. Yes. You know, I mean, yeah. I'm in so many, uh, you know, I taught screenwriting and, and one of the basic, you know, principles of screenwriting is that your characters should change, <laughs> that they have a problem and then they resolve the problem or it's tragic and they don't resolve the problem. And like, but there's growth and there's all these things that there's yeah. a structure to how a movie works. There is no structure to our fucking lives no. and nobody, and, and we don't actually always change. You yeah. know, we don't go like, oh, I figured this shit out. That's not how this happens. Yeah. You know, like, the, and and this movie, and again, that's also the 70s, as you, as you so well right. put. Right. Like, like, when you get to the 80s, it's like, we're going to have these well-constructed movies where everything is there for a reason, and you get to the end, and it feels great, and that's awesome. And I love 80s movies. I know you right. do, too. Yeah. In 70s, it's like, here's some shit. <laughs> yeah. Here's the reality of it all. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Speaking of which, shall we jump back into the film? Let's do it. I, I, you know, we don't always plan exactly where we're going to break our parts, but I'm really happy about this one because where we're jumping back in is Jake LaMotta fighting Sugar Ray Robinson. Yeah. You can see the contrast in their styles. The speedy Ray Robinson up on his toes, the dancing master, LaMotta the brawler, moves in. I want to talk about the actor playing Sugar Ray Robinson. Because Let's do it because I have thoughts on that as well, please. He's unique in film because he has no lines. Mm -hmm. he, he's like... I don't know, symbolic of something. He's like iconic in a way, yeah. like beyond human in some sort of way. There's a almost a mystical element to mm -hmm. this character. Um, the actor, by the way, is Johnny Barnes. And he says that Sugar Ray Robinson was his hero since he was a kid. Wow. And that people came up to him as a kid and told him, someday you will play Sugar Ray Robinson. <laughs> I don't know if I believe this. It just sounds so bizarre. People called him Baby Ray. Yeah. And when his family lived in Harlem, the Robinsons were the, nearby and he had met them. Wow. He, he was a boxer. He right. sounds like he frequently boxed just to support his drug habit. Um, and he went through a very complicated life, including wanting to play Sugar Ray Robinson again, <laughs> which never happened. What's, what's your feeling on him in this film? Yeah. I thought about him more as I was watching the movie. Again, this is, these are the things about getting older and becoming more seasoned as a movie watcher, but also doing our show. You know, you're, trying to pick out things as you're watching a movie that you normally maybe wouldn't have picked out or might have gone by you. And I've always been struck by him in the movie because, as you say, he never says a word. Uh, and you see him speaking sometimes to his corner men, but we don't hear what they're saying. Um, 
but he has such an interesting face. And I would say Sugar Ray Robinson in real life is better looking than this actor. Yeah. But I think what they were trying to show is this actor is Lamada's comeuppance. He is Lamada's punishment in essence. And so what you see there when Lamada beats him the first time, he is on the come up, right? He is going to be, he established himself. He's on his way to the title. But they actually fought six times, and oh, six. Uh, wow. Robinson is five and one. He beat him five times out of six times. So, and the brute, most brutal being the I think second or third to last fight that Lamada fought there in Saint Valentine's Day Massacre, and the way it's portrayed in the movie, which I know we'll get to later on, is pretty extensive and and brutal. And then I watched the actual footage, which is on YouTube, of that round. They have that round on mm. YouTube, and you can see it, and it is just harrowing what uh, what uh, Lamada was able to survive. And at the time when that fight happens, it's Lamada messing stuff up with uh, with Vicky. It's Lamada having beaten up his brother. So it's Lamada coming to the end where even he hates himself so much that he doesn't want to even win anymore. And Sugar Ray sees that. And the way it's shot, the way he is with the, uh, the you know, you compare that know. to um, uh, Stallone slowing down Mr. T before he launches those punches in the first movie, you know, sorry, in the first fight in Rocky three, when remember he takes that moment when, uh, you know, Rocky's like hanging on the ropes, barely standing. And um, Stallone focuses the camera on clubber as clubber winds up to drop the bomb, to knock out Rocky there and knock him out of the fight in the second round. Similarly here in the movie, in that last fight, you see Sugar Ray's hand, hang in the air above the light there behind with a light glowing behind it and then delivers the brutal blow to Lamada. Doesn't knock him out, doesn't knock him down as he reminds us, but he gives the punishment to Lamada that has been well-deserved. And so I think Robinson appears at certain times in the movie to be um, a person who administers punishment on Lamada for his transgressions and for his sins. So the way he's almost elfish like in his look slightly demonic in his look and i kind of like that as a um counter to lamada that he is administering this um brutal blows to him throughout the movie you know what's interesting is that we, i think this is in general is a very real world feeling film you know like mm -hmm. the way the characters talk yeah. the way we exist in the world it is very like on the streets and real yeah except when it's not because what it's not, and the, and I think these examples you're bringing of the fights with Sugar Ray Robinson, we go to a completely artistic realm. You know, it is it is experiential, it is symbolic, it is all these other things. And I think part of the the mix between the artistry of the filmmaking and the realness of the filmmaking, and the same with the acting, yeah. is what makes this one of the great films. And 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 I should say that every one of these fights, and this is just you know this is where the genius filmmakers exist where the not genius filmmakers don't exist, which is that most people would go, my job is to film this fight. And so they yeah. would have to fight. Right. Right. That's not what Scorsese is doing. Every single fight has a different visual concept. Mm -hmm. It is approached in a different way stylistically. And so every fight has different lenses, different right. angles, different cutting styles, different uses of slow motion or fast motion or freeze frames or whatever. Mm -hmm. This fight is mostly shot with wide angle lenses. So you get a big sense of space. And not only did he use wide angle lenses, but he actually extended the ring. So the yeah. ring is much bigger than a normal boxing ring yeah. because he wanted this sense of size. You know, and this is why we go like they went to shoot for five weeks for the fight scenes and it took 10 weeks hmm. because of the particularness of how they wanted to do this. I want to talk a little bit about the sound design. The sound design in this movie is amazing. Yeah. The, uh, the sound guy is Frank Warner, who also did Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He hmm. did Rocky. He did Taxi Driver. And he sounds like a mad genius. <laughs> he's, uh, and, and he would frequently, he's bringing all these sounds to Scorsese. And Scorsese's like, well, what is that? Where'd you get that? He's like, I'm not telling you. Anybody's right at this point. Ten longer. There's animal sounds in here. There's gunshots in here. There's all sorts of sounds that he's mixing together and doing it in a different way for every single fight, for every single punch almost. There are different sounds. Yeah, I love it. I catch it because it's very reminiscent of that cockatoo and cane, you know. So when you oh, hear yeah. that loud uh, noise, animalistic noise or scream coming through in certain moments, it's to add to the horror of what's happening, right? Yeah. And, and to the brutality of this. And remember, again, this is 
Scorsese at a time coming out of this addiction, right? What do people talk about when they're coming out of the addiction? The demons, the noises they hear, the visions they have, uh, and the feelings that they encounter as they're coming out of addiction in their darkest moments. And so when you're seeing the way he's portraying boxing here, it is not glorified. It is not in any way, shape, portrayed to be something that, that is noble or heroic and that you'd want to do. It is brutal. It is bloody. It is rough. It is... Um, uh, uh, it, it takes a lot out of you physically and the end result, uh, at times, even when you win, sometimes you really lose depending on yeah. how you feel coming out of it. So I love the way he shoots these scenes and these boxing sequences and the way he messes with the sound designs you mentioned as well, accompanied with occasional rapid, like fast forwarding the movie in certain sections. Right. So you get that feeling or slowing down in certain sections. So you savor that moment a little bit more. Love the combo here. He's constantly unsettling us as a viewer um, throughout these boxing sequences. So we're kind of caught up feeling on edge the whole time because we can't really relax. We can't really feel comfortable in our seats. And that's the whole purpose, I believe, of him showing this, what this battle can do to you, man. Well, and speaking of how he's messing with speed and time and the way he's filming it, this is a perfect yeah. example, which is when Jake knocks Sugar Ray out of the ring. Is that first it goes into really fast motion, which has this, it makes you feel the punch, you know what yeah. I mean, in this way, because it moves so fast. Then there's like an overexposed shot, and then there's a freeze frame. It all happens really, really fast. And this is Scorsese. I mean, this is some of the yeah. stuff we were talking about that we see in Goodfellas. And then we see Jake, after we had this super fast action of him getting knocked out, of Ray getting knocked out of the ring, we have Jake in slow motion as he moves back to his corner and then circles, and then it comes back up to regular motion. And I just, these things are so hard. This is why it takes so long. So what you have to understand about shooting in film, and at this time, this is a mechanical analog era. Today, with digital cameras and CG, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. And we do it all using computers and very sophisticated technology. Here, they are manually slowing down and speeding up the rate of the film moving through the camera. So mm -hmm. there's a guy doing that. And then you also, because, and this, I'm not a cinematographer, this is not my area of expertise, but slow motion has uh, different exposure levels than f fast motion. So as you change the speed, you also have to change the aperture of the lens. Otherwise, things are going to get darker and lighter as you speed up and slow down. Mm -hmm. And so there's also someone who is changing the aperture, and there's someone who's adjusting the focus because we're moving closer and farther away from Jake. Mm -hmm. And all these are happening mechanically. And then this is the thing they said, and this just seems crazy to me, was there's no way, there was no way for them to monitor what actual speed the camera was at at what point, what frame rate. Yeah. Yeah. And so the way they judged how to j adjust the exposure was by the sound of the motor that's running the camera, the film through the camera. So yeah. as he hears it speeding up, He's, I don't remember if it's opening or closing. I think if it speeds up that you have to open up the aperture because there's less time for to expose the film. And yeah. then as he hears it slow down, then he slows, he closes down the aperture and it has to be in sync. That's so hard. It's just so <laughs> hard to do that it just blows my mind, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's, 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 fuck, that's a lot of work, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Well, and this is where I go like, this is why it goes from five weeks to 10 weeks. Yeah. Because right. Scorsese has this idea, and then they have to execute that idea. Judge Murphy, seven to three, Lamata. Lamata has won the fight. And that's Robinson's first loss as a professional. I like that Scorsese keeps the, like um, has a shot of him speaking to his corner man, and then looking back over his shoulder at Jake. There's no respect. There's no kind of like, oh man, I feel bad. He's more pissed off. He's more feels like he's gotten screwed over. And so I kind of like that, that this is a thing that can't be beat. This is the thing that will give you nothing and will keep coming back for you over and over and over again to administer his punishment on you. So I kind yeah. of appreciated that uh, with him, that there was no like levels and vulnerability and all this kind of stuff going on with Sugar Ray. He's just a, a, just a, a mission. He's on a mission to destroy Lamada, you know? Well, this is the thing about Sugar Ray as portrayed in this film. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it's like, this isn't, and, and I don't want to get into like the, the, the racial issues of it. I think there's certainly people mm. that can analyze it in ways that would be sure. uh, complex. But the, the fact is he is not treated. He's treated as a demon. As you said, he's yeah. treated as an entity. He's not yeah. treated as a, a human, you know? Right. 
Um, th- th- that is not the purpose he is serving in this film. Yeah. We're back to Jake and Vicky's place. He is lying in the bed. The camera is shooting past his feet as she opens the door. She's in a nightgown. It's daytime. I think this scene is um, it's amazing in, in, in a completely different way. Come here. You said never to touch her before a fight. Which is true. Jake r- really didn't have sex before fights because he yeah. thought it made you weak. Women um, weak in legs. Yeah. Exactly. And he says, Come here before I give you a beat. I, what I found fascinating is there was this time where violent language towards women was just accepted, you know? Yeah. Like, think of the honeymooners and to the moon, Alice, you know, like he's literally physically threatening his wife. And that is the funny line that people quoted from the TV show, you know? Yeah. So I will ask this question. I already kind of know, know what your answer is going to be, yeah. but has he given Vicky beatings in the past? I don't know at this point if he has. Um, and I think this is just playful banter at this point until we see the, the beatings come up in the film. Right. So we don't know if you're watching this, you don't know the history of these two. That's like a playful little exchange. Right. I mean, listen, the lady out all, uh, all, uh, we have fun uh, joking about that as well. You know, like, just what she was always talking about wanting to eat my cheeks off my face and things like that. Kind of like you see in um, punch drunk love, right? Right. right. Talking, I want to take a hammer to your face. Those are playful exchanges when you both understand that there's no real, you know, threat behind it. Uh, and so um, to me, I, I found this to be an ironic exchange considering what's coming up later in their relationship. And people need to remember Jake was 24. She was 16 when they yeah. got married. All right. He got her pregnant. So, that's it, this was a, a very interesting life, and having read some more stuff on Vicky, I mean, she was fourteen when she was raped, and she was always kind of beholden to men in her life. And her father, at one point when she was getting attention from men, her father shaved her head bald so that she wouldn't be getting that attention anymore. So this woman was very abused by a number of male figures, older male figures in her life, um, and so getting into a horribly codependent, abusive relationship. Uh, is not surprising. And so having Jake be in that moment and having her come out and look, Scorsese, the time, you know, he's shooting her in a virginal way. The light is behind her. She's in this white, beautiful sheer gown. She's kind of being, kind of getting a come hither scare, stare as half of her face is covered by the door. It's very sexy. This whole scene is very sexy um, amidst the brutality. Amid, and he's the champion, or he's just beating Sugar Robinson right now, not the champion, but he's, he's, beaten sugar ray so this is kind of like the a high point in his life so this scene carries some weight to it um but even the scene is not 100 percent like oh wow i i really care about their story right because as you said jake jokes jake jokes about beating her and then later he rejects her and then goes in and pours cold water on his on his um private area so he doesn't get to erect you know so uh i want to go back to this this line because I I agree with you when he says, come here before I give you a beating, that this is a joke. That, yeah, this this is, is that he's, he's not seriously threatening her at all. Right. I do think he's hit her before this. Okay. I think that's just, I think that's part of Jake's behavior. And, and awesome. you know, yeah. like that. And so that's where it comes out to me. Now, I am not going to describe every detail that happens in this scene, nor every line that happens, because I'm talking into a microphone that's going directly into john's headphones and he doesn't really need to listen to me you know (laughs) describe sexy things i don't think anybody really wants to hear that sexy times yeah (laughs) but what i will say is i think this scene is beautifully done you know the scene it reminds me of is it reminds me of breathless there's very much yeah good call because it's so real call yeah it just feels because the thing about breathless is we've never been intimately in someone's apartment right just ha- seeing how a couple behaves with each other. And that's what I'm seeing here. And all of the stuff feels just so real to me. Mm-hmm. Like just real. It's this isn't, you know, Scorsese hasn't done a lot of like sex scenes right. and usually sex scenes in movies are designed to be sexy. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this scene isn't sexy. I think it is, mm-hmm. but this scene is, it is sexy because it just feels so natural yeah. and real. Agreed. Like we're spying on these people. Yep. Um, Jake r- really did uh, pour ice water down his sh- shorts <laughs> to keep himself in control. He also did another thing. In addition to generally not having sex before a fight, yeah. he would have sex and not finish. 
Ooh. And he described this as just one more way that he liked to torture himself. I mean, Jake's a masochist. He likes putting himself in terrible, difficult situations. That's yeah. something that he does. Yeah. I also find the way, by the way, just the religious imagery that's on the walls contrasting with what's happening in the scene, I also think is, you know, kind of key to the movie. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Which, of course, we know Scorsese is very big about. Yeah. It is uh, three weeks later and he's fighting Sugar Ray Robinson again. Yeah. That's crazy. Right? I mean, yeah. that's how it was back then, right? Yeah. Just like with films. You were making films in the 40s and 50s. You were doing them, what, like 20 a, a, a year? 20 a year you were in. You know, it was crazy back in those days how things were moving so fast. And yeah, like the announcer says, no one else wanted to fight him, fight either of them. So they had to fight each other because they had yeah. they had a dearth of of opponents to choose from. To stay sharp, they had to fight each other. So. It's just three weeks. I mean, the bruises haven't healed. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, right. Exactly. No, it's a good point. Yeah. Like, and I bet Sugar Ray is the one that's like, get me in the ring again, because no way he fucking oh, yeah. beat me. I want my revenge, you know? Yeah. So, and conceptually, again, we said each of these fights has a different concept. This mm -hmm. one, the first one was with wide lenses. This one's with long lenses. And then they wanted it to feel hot. And so they have all of this smoke. So you're yeah. looking through this blurry, smoky image. And the other thing they're doing, and this is just a really cool thing, is you might notice that it's wavering. That yes. there's sort of a, a, a wavering quality. Yeah. You want to know? Do you know how they got this? How? Oh. Um, what they did was they put flames, literal flames. There's a little like barbecue right in front of the lens. Oh my! Because God. you know the effect when you're in the desert and it's really yeah. hot and you see sort of the wavering in the air. That's how they created this. Is there literally are flames just below the lens to heat up the air directly in front of the camera? It's like high plains drifter just coming out of that. Yeah. Oh my God, that's crazy yep. that they would put fire near a lens. Uh, that's crazy to me. But it really works because when I was rewatching it for the show, I thought to myself, oh, fuck, that's a bad transfer. What was that all about? And then now that you explain, it, I'm like, oh, of course, it's all for effect to get you into that mood that this is kind of a weird, again, demonic cauldron of hell. This yeah. kind of imagery going on here to get you to have maybe subconsciously that feeling of like, you know, in uh, surrounded by flames. The. Uh, natural order of things in if you are a Catholic who believes in that stuff. And unsurprisingly, Sugar Ray's ahead on points and Lamada's going to have to get a knockout yeah. and he knocks him down with a left hook. Robinson goes down. There's like seven animals <laughs> in the sound of him throwing this punch. <laughs> it's like, I know like the T-Rex is a, a, a lion and a crocodile and like all these things in Jurassic Park. Yeah. This is the same thing. Like, this is like these le complex layers of sound that makes this fight completely unique. Yeah. This is the second time Robinson's ever gone down. The great shot of him as he looks up uh, at, yeah. at Jake. And it, it, I, and I did th this guy, um, and, and I don't have his name in front of me, the, the actor playing Johnny Robert, Barnes. Yeah. yeah. Johnny Barnes, he does a great job. Yeah. Just a fantastic job. Yeah. And this guy is a boxer, he boxed in the army. So, I mean, like he, he had experience before he stepped in the ring to do this stuff with De Niro. So playing these moments, probably realistic for him having experienced some of these moments in the ring. Um, by the way, the real Jake LaMotta says on the commentary track that he always had a lot of respect for Robinson and that he was a great fighter. Mm. Um, How nice of Jake to say that. I know. That's kind of the response that I had. Well, and it's so funny because Jake LaMotta does not say the stuff you're supposed to say most of the time. In this case, he did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and we see, you know, Jake is going for that knockout. He's going for the win, but it's, you know, it's too little, too late, and he loses in the decision. Well, this is the game that we see happen throughout the whole movie, right? That Jake has a tendency to do this. Jake has a tendency to wait till the last minute and then turn it on, uh, you know, very much like Rocky, right? Like, oh, all of a sudden, turn it on. You know, I know he landed the first punch against Apollo, but for a majority of that fight with Apollo in the first Rocky movie, he's getting his ass kicked. And in the second fight as well. And uh, he has he has occasional flurries, but he's pretty much getting his ass kicked for a majority of these fights. And his luck, he luckily wins by one second in Rocky too. And then, you know, we see what happens later on in those other fights. But the thing with Jake is that he had that tendency to kind of wait till the last second. Like he was playing a little bit of a, a, a rope a dope, so to speak, or suckering people in. Uh, and he thought he could turn it on and, and, and win in that way. And like you said, it's a guy who tortured himself. So maybe for him, he had to kind of get himself beat up for a while before he finally started reacting to certain situations. And eventually that catches up to you because your body can't take that much pounding 
uh, before you, you, you know the judges before you're able to administer the punishment you want to administer. So yeah, with Sugar Ray, it just didn't work except for once. It's funny you say that because this is exactly what Jake says. So Jake mm-hmm. says that one of the first lessons he learned was that he could take a punch, you know, yeah. obviously. I mean, this guy takes a punch like nobody. Yeah. And that he thinks he took a ton of unnecessary punches. And he said that he felt on some level that he deserved it. And yeah. he didn't deserve whatever good was coming. And, that, right. and so, like, this was like punishment that he deserved. And, the, and this is the thing that he said. He said he always wanted to see if he could take their punches before he tried to hit them. Yeah. Both because he needed to test himself you know, and Mm -hmm. prove it. But then this was also in his mind, his way of scaring them because if he came out early and took their best punches and it didn't hurt him, then they were going to be scared. So that was, that was how he, he really did do this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No surprise. And we cut to Joey breaking a chair in like the locker room because he is pissed off about the decision. decision because he's going in the army next week that's the only reason i knocked him down i don't know what else i gotta do i don't know what i gotta do and there's a real plaintive lost tone i think in his voice mm-hmm. i've done a lot of bad things joey maybe it's coming back to me what do you think about that line it's a this whole scene is a critical scene in the movie it's a fulcrum scene in my opinion because one he's just lost to sugar ray in a way that he thinks is controversial certainly joey does by smashing the chairs yeah. and getting all emotional and stuff but Jake has is he's only he's like half smiling about it all, like almost like you know you have those moments where you're outside your body in certain uh, experiences, and you're almost looking at yourself experiencing the thing, you know. And there, I think this has an element of that to it that he's kind of contemplating his life in a way and saying, "Oh yeah, may, I've done a lot of bad things, Joe. I, maybe I deserve this. Maybe maybe I'm a jinx," is what he says. Maybe I'm not mm-hmm. destined to win this thing. And, for all his efforts of trying to win it his way, he's he also has a very strong self-destructive impulse. Um, and having you know dealt with my own, I know what that's all about. So when he's saying, like, maybe I'm a jinx, maybe I'm never going to make it, maybe those are the narratives that a lot of people tell themselves that keep them from success or can endanger them achieving success for sure. But he's got that moment. He's almost kind of like um, resigned to it so to speak. And he has kind of this smile on his face, which I think is fascinating in the midst of all this. And then he tells Joey to take Vicky home because Vicky wants to come in and stuff. So again, this is an important moment because later he's going to accuse his brother of having sex with his wife and stuff. And so he's lost in that thing. So, But then Marty moves the camera to focus on Jake's hand in the ice. And I was looking at it thinking to myself like and, and Jake is looking at himself in the mirror and certainly I've had those moments in my yeah. earlier days and earlier times of my life where I could not understand why I had all this rage and why I had all this self-hate and self uh low self-worth and, and when everyone around me and my family was like you know we love you we love you but for whatever reason uh, I was uh, born with this and experienced certain things at a formative age that that wrecked me and so made me like you know really kind of hate myself in a lot of ways for a lot of years and would have those moments looking at the mirror you know just you fuck up you absolute you you nobody you nothing you what is wrong with you and all those things i'm sure a lot of people listening have had those moments for themselves whether they're in the looking in a mirror or driving their car or whatever so the fact that he just kind of looks at himself and you can tell he's looking at himself saying the same things saying some narrative to himself over and over again and dipping the hand in the ice is so fascinating because as a guy who seeks symbolism in certain moments and why directors put things in certain in frames, I was thinking, what does this mean? Is he is he drowning his hands? Is he trying to cool himself down? Is he like just preparing himself for what's to come? I have no idea what the close up on the hand in the ice bucket meant, but the fact that he lingers on it, I have a feeling Scorsese was trying to tell us something by having that shot there and the scene before we move on to him going on a run of victories, you know. So first of all, we just talked about the fact that Jake said he sometimes let people punch him because he felt yep. he needs to be punished. Right. So this line about, I've done a lot of bad things, Joey, maybe that's coming back to me, that fits right in. And I got to say, and we'll get to it, there is a moment in the commentary track from Jake LaMotta mm-hmm. where he goes off wow. and is just loses it. And the thing he keeps yelling about is karma. Karma is a real thing. And we'll get to what that scene is where he goes off because it's fascinating yeah. and not and not fun. <laughs> but uh, so that that's one thing. I there 
I think this moment of looking in the mirror, remember, he, you know, De Niro looks in the mirror in Taxi Driver in one of the yeah. most important moments of the film. It's true. And his hand in the ice, water is extremely symbolic in this right. film. Yeah. You know, the first shot that we really get drawn to with Vicky is her in slow motion, bouncing mm-hmm. her legs in the pool in the water. I, per- of course, we can interpret this all sorts of ways. Um, But for me, water is about cleansing. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a religious purification of it. And I think it is the purity of Vicky, you know, in some ways that he sees this young, young, beautiful, blonde, you know, it's not exactly that she's innocent, but I think there's a, you know, you know, this is someone who's literally battling their demons. And I think he feels that this was for something bad that he had done. And that is why he's lost this fight. And now he's cleansing his hands in the ice water and looking at himself. I mean, I think these are the, the battles. And it's funny, there, there's a moment in taxi driver that I was always fascinated by, which is that there's, he's sitting with all the drivers and they're eating. And then someone drops like an alka seltzer into a cup and, and, um, Travis. Travis just yeah zooms in on that and just stares at that and and disconnects from everything that's going in the room, yeah. and this is where in that when Scorsese was talking about that he said I wanted to show people how I see the world, mm. and this is the same moment of him look at the ice in the hand yeah. or Vicky's legs, whereas there's just this hyper focus and there's this intensity mm. about just being in a particular moment, and I I've totally had this. Yeah. Where you just get pulled into a thing, disconnecting, you know, at a party, at a, you know, surrounded by people, and suddenly you're just drawn into a moment. Um, yeah, I think these are, I think these are very important moments of the film. Yeah. Um, it's Jake LaMotta versus uh, Zivic in Detroit, 1944. And now we're going to see a whole bunch of fights, mostly in still frames. Yeah. As, and it's sort of a montage, and it's intercut with home movies that are suddenly in color. Yeah. Which I think is an amazing choice. And this came from the fact that Vicky gave Scorsese her home movies. They really yeah. had movies like this. And so <laughs> Scorsese goes to the DP, Michael Chapman, and says, I want to film something like this. So we get 16 millimeter old color film camera. And Michael Chapman starts filming things. And he basically what he said is I, he couldn't shoot them badly enough <laughs> to make them look like home movies. They kept being well framed. I was well too framed. good. I'm sorry. I was too good. I couldn't give it to so you. So he goes to Marty and he says, Marty, you got to film this. I can't, I can't do it. I can't make it look amateur enough. And so Marty goes to film them and they look too good. <laughs> <laughs> and so what they did was they went to like the Teamsters and they went oh. to the craft service guy. They kept that's handing good. other people the camera that were amateurs. And that's where this came from which I think is hilarious. Yeah. By the way, they were so good that the real Vicky, when she saw them, she kept confusing herself for Kathy Moriarty. She couldn't tell which was the real ones. Wow. And which were the ones that they made for the movie. Um, The other thing that they did, because then they have to age the film. You have to make it look beat up. So first they desaturate it and they do all this stuff kind of in post to, to, to mess up the film. But then they go to the person who cuts the negative. And this is, so the last stage of making a movie is you actually have to conform yeah. what you're working on when you're editing. You really are cutting film with a razor blade and taping it together in order to right. edit your film, right? right? Well, eventually, you have to go to the negative, the original film, because your rough cut, uh, your work print that you've been using, it's all beat to shit at this yeah. point. So you have this pristine, perfect negative of the original filming of the film. And you are going to go through and cut the negative to conform to the edit, Right. And the way you do this is it's it's once you do it, you can't undo it. There's no undoing this process. So this is, and this is the film, right? Yeah. So any mistake you made, any piece of dust, any scratch, that is permanently on the film. There's no hmm. computers to fix anything. And so negative cutters are extremely anal and particular people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because they cannot fuck up. If you spent, you know, $10 million making your movie, then this one person can fuck that up. So yeah. they have to do it all perfectly. Marty comes into the negative cutters room with a, uh, a wire hanger and he starts crumpling the film and the negative cutter is freaking out. <laughs> like, no, you can't. You stop, stop, stop. In order to get the movie to look like this. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And we see intercut between these fights that are, again, mostly in freeze frame and mostly of Jake winning this footage of joey's wedding of home life of the kids of barbecues it's all it's all 
Really fun. Um, one more thing about this sequence, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. One more thing is they go to one of the early screenings, okay? Mm. And Thelma Schoonmaker has to, you know, check to make sure everything's all right in yeah. terms of how is it going to be projected, how is the sound, all that stuff. And she goes to the projectionist, and the projectionist goes, don't worry, I fixed it for you. And she goes, what are you talking about? He's like, well, it's a black and white movie. There were all these color footage in it, so I cut, <laughs> I cut it all out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man people people man people right so what do you think of this sequence <laughs> oh i love the sequence um i think it's great because also it's in listen you can't make a film where the person the protagonist is so terrible that the audience doesn't connect right you're always it's always a danger when you're showing a protagonist that's in a strong so you've got to humanize him and i think this this whole entire montage humanizes Jake a little bit for the audience so that you can sense the tragedy of the end there when he's or near the end when he's going crazy in the in the uh, jail cell you have to care about the guy you have to actually feel some sympathy for the guy so there are some sweet moments between him and Vicky in some of these shots and and of course in retrospect when you watch the movie it's almost like oh no you don't know what's coming right but when you're watching it the first time it's just, I think it's just about humanizing and getting and, and you know you don't have to do exposition joey we got married joey had kids so we're moving on from all of that and we're jumping a lot of years plus we're showing in really stylistic well shot ways these montages of the fights that are like in still frame that like you would see in a 1950s newspaper right yeah. like the perfect shot uh having flash bulbs go off so all of that mixed in i think is a really smart way to do a time jump that fits um, the movie, but also humanizes your protagonist just before we're at to send him off the edge uh, over the next few minutes of the movie. And so I think it's a really smart move by them. And the one thing Vicky Lamada in reading the excerpts from her thoughts on the movie, she said that she saw the movie six times, by the way, three times with Jake, including the premiere. And she said that she, the only problem she had with the movie, because she loved Kathy, she thought Kathy did a wonderful job with her. She said that I wish the movie had shown more of the positive aspects of our marriage, mm -hmm. that it wasn't just him beating me 24-7. There was a lot of positive stuff that happened. Uh, and by the time I left, it just was the positive stuff was ending. And so right. it was it was uh, the right time for me to leave. But she felt that. And so this is a way to kind of show that, that it wasn't all just beatings and terrible things, that there were some nice moments between them um, there and how they established their relationship. So it's a smart move. It gets the job done enough so that when things start to happen as we go along in the movie, you're connected to this relationship a little bit more, you know? Well, I mean, there have to be positive things. Yeah. If, yeah. if they're not positive things, you, why would you be, you don't stay, you know, like the whole, you know, and having sadly witnessed a few abusive relationships. Yeah. I see the positive thing. The positive things are frequently really positive. Yeah. Over the top positive. Which to is why make up. Stay. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, we're in the Bronx, it's New York, 1947, we're at Jake's house, he comes down the stairs, looking a little heavy. <laughs> yeah. And he is pissed. Don't ever do that Gennaro bullshit again. No more deals like that, you hear what I'm saying? What, you talking about? what am I talking about? Look at that, 168 pounds. And the problem is, he's at 168 pounds, he's gotta get down to 155, 13 pounds, yeah. quickly. If you're the one that told me you could get down to 155 pounds, when I get it, when I pull it out of the fucking air, I don't know if I'm going to make it down to 155. I'm lucky I'll make it to 160. And on top of that, you sign me for a fight at 155, and if I don't make the 155, I lose $15,000. That's right. Oh, you're supposed to be a manager. You're supposed to know what you're doing. We have, uh, by the way, uh, Lenore, Joey's wife, who's played by Teresa Saldana, mm -hmm. is here in the scene and what she says she's also on the commentary track mm. she says that de niro and pesci they were pretty much in character all the time oh god and so that meant you know they they set the tone so that meant that she tried to be pretty much in character all the time what are you worried about what's the biggest thing you got to worry about the weight about the weight you worried about the weight what are we arguing about for i just said the weight okay let's say you lose because of your weight are they gonna think you're not as tough as you were you're not the same fighter good they'll match with all those guys that were afraid to match with before what happens you'll kill them i love the way that joey lays this out for him in this scene mm -hmm. and in the midst of this jake asks vicky for a coffee mm -hmm. and she says a minute and he goes please bring me a coffee the 
the and I've, again, I've witnessed abusive relationships. Yeah. People that don't realize that you cannot magically make coffee appear, <laughs> or you might be in the middle of doing another thing that you can't stop at that second, and they're just right. giving the coffee. That just pisses me off. <laughs> Please, honey, bring me the call. All right. Oh, and while I gotta wait, are you listening? <laughs> now let's say you win, you beat your Nero, yeah. which is definitely should beat him, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. They still gotta give you a shot at the title. You know why? Why? Cause the same thing as before. There's nobody left. There ain't nobody around. They gotta give you the shot. You understand? If you win, you win. If you lose, you still win. Mm. It's a great explanation. Yep. You want to know how Marty Scorsese, what Marty Scorsese describes the scene or what he relates it to? What's that? This is him talking to his agent as his agent tries to explain business to him. <laughs> he just, he's like, I see, you know, they explain it to me. I never quite understand. They explain why the percentages and how I'm supposed to be. And he's like, I just, just shake, nod my head as if I get it. Even when you lose, you win. Yeah. You know, Joey's right. This Gennaro is an up and coming fighter. He's good looking. He's popular. He beat him there. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. What do you mean, good looking? And the, the reaction? <laughs> I'm not saying good looking. I'm saying popular. If you yeah, win. What were you to say, what, good looking? Popular. I'm not saying anything. I'm just telling you, Joey's hey, right. Honey, what, what? What are you, an authority or what? No, Get take it. Get out of here. It's just, you can feel the danger. Yes. Pop and up. because we've seen him obsess. Yep. About tiny details. And she was just saying good looking in a way that he's a young kid, right? And she was saying how you're going to tear him up and whatever. He's, it's it's a good move for you to do this. Um, but of course, his jealousy, his paranoia, his low self-worth, low self-esteem, his anger, his psychopathy, whatever you want to say, you know, now has him obsess about this one offhand comment from Vicky. Because I think at the end of the day with the relationship... Jake hates himself so much that it was fun to win her and flirt her and get her. Yeah. Now she's so good. And everyone talks about how nice Vicky was as a person. Everyone talks about how cool she was as a human being, despite all the abuse, despite all the shit she endured. She's a good hearted person. So it only reflects back at him how much of a monster he is. And so she was a daily reminder that he is a monster. And so this is the thing that drives, I think, these moments where he's trying to take her down. He's trying to catch her in things. He's trying to find her hiding her ugliness from him in terms of behavior, behavior ways um, because he wants to reduce her down so that they're equal, right? And But he can't. And so he has to fabricate this shit. He has to be obsessed about little things and imbue meaning into those things that were not there so that he can have some measure of control in the situation. I, I think the point you bring up that's so important, and and it's like, intuitively, I knew it, but I hadn't thought about it until the way you said it, which is, none of this is about Vicky. It's all about Jake. Mm-hmm. It's all Jake's insecurities. It's not- Everything it, he does is through is Jake's insecurities. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Well, and just to be clear, has Vicky seen Gennaro, and does she think he's good looking? I don't think she's seen him at all, and she even says that. I, I've never even seen a picture of this guy. Like I think that's a, for me. I think that's a lie. I think she did see him and was okay. and, and thought he was good looking. Well, you got a guy who's going to beat the shit out of you if you don't if you say the right thing. Of course, she has to say I haven't seen him. You know. Well, she also shouldn't say he's good looking then if she knows she's gonna he's gonna beat her up. You well, know, why you even let obviously? That well, well, and people shouldn't be beaten up for thinking someone is good of looking. Of course I mean, not. <laughs> I mean, you know me. You know? Like I, I, you know, I'm not a jealous person. And Karen and I, when we were together, would constantly say like, "Oh, that's a good looking person. That's good." I yeah. don't care because, and the reason for me is like, no, objectively, that is a good looking person. Like denying that the person is good looking is is irrational. Right. But this is, you know, this is yeah. how I look at the world. You stupid person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so he sends her out. Obviously, he's upset. And then Lenore, Joey's wife, says, She didn't mean nothing. Boy, it's true. Now, this is an improv. Oh. Again, Marty, because there's a lot of improv in the set. And, know, Marty. Yeah. and Marty said to her, look, if you feel like chiming in at some point, chime in. And Le- Teresa Saldana, the actress, did feel bad for Vicky at this moment. And, you know, it was like, look, we're the two wives. I kind of took her side. Yeah. Man, the look from Joe Pesci when yeah. she chimes in is fantastic. Yeah. You know, because Teresa Saldana said she was genu- genuinely annoyed at how they were treating Vicky. And then in the next moment, when he says, who asked you? 
Yeah. She was genuinely scared, you know? Yeah, yeah. When people are talking, you don't interrupt. It's none of your business. Especially if it's my brother and his wife. It got nothing to do with you. Now get out of here. Go inside. Get out. Take the baby inside. I mean, we see this. We've seen this portrayed in numerous Italian portrayals of families. I'm not saying it's across the board of generalization, but we've seen this in movies, right? Like um, when Sonny was trying to chime in, you know, and and um, in the relationship oh, yeah. with, uh, with Connie and, and Carlo, it's the, her, his mom, the Godfather's wife, who was like, "Sonny, don't don't. It's not your business. Don't interrupt." Yeah. It's between. So there's that kind of thing in the culture that from what we've seen in the movies. Now I don't know if people who listen to us who are Italian if it's true or not, but Certainly, it feels that way from some segments of the Italian uh, uh, culture. And so you see that here in this moment come through how Joey turns out. Do I think Joey's going to put his hands on her? No, but I do think Joey's like, yo, there's a certain way this goes down. You don't chime in. It's not there. It's not your business. You know? So Joey wants to kind of diffuse the, the situation. Mm-hmm. And he's like, let's, let's go to training camp. There's no distractions. And Jake says, when I'm away, you ever notice anything funny going on with her? What do you think? Yeah. Like what? What do you think I mean? So, one of the ambiguities of this film mm-hmm. that I don't feel or is amb- like it doesn't seem ambiguous to me. Like I, I feel like I, we don't know what Vicky has done or not done. You know, okay. We only have, and there are people, and this is you know, I kind of looked around online too, who go like, well, did Vicky sleep with Sal? Did Vicky do these things? Right now, my feeling is that she did not. Yes, you know. Yeah, but you know, the, the the movie does not clearly tell you either way. You know, I I can't agree. I feel like it does. In my opinion, I feel like she didn't do any of these things. That's and I feel like I it's too. very clear she didn't do any of these things, and that it's all Jake's paranoia that is fueling this these feelings. You know, because we don't see her except for one scene. And her defense is like, I just want to get out of the house. This fucker puts me in a cage. I'm a young girl. I want to enjoy my life. And she's not going out like, uh, you know, sleeping with anybody. She's just doing her thing. So the way the movie portrays, I think, is that she actually is, you know, been very clean and it hasn't been an issue. And that's Jake's all, it's all in Jake's mind. So that is 100% how I feel too. But mm. when I looked around and I see there are a lot of people who actually wonder about this. So probably met. Probably gonna, I'm probably sure. Met. Yeah. When I won't know any woman given the right time, the right place, the right circumstance, they'll do anything. Yeah. I mean, anything's possible. Yeah. All right. Are you I right? Know. And I'm just like, well, yes, anything is possible. And sure. that, but there's just this weirdness of like, you have no, uh, yeah, it, you know what I'm saying. It's just like, come on. Oh, no, of course. But he has to say that because he knows he would. That's the thing. Right. He puts his negative behavior on her. This he can only see himself in the world. He can only function through his own prism. So he thinks everyone else is capable of doing terrible stuff just like he is. He has to believe that so that he can, you know, have some semblance of one upsmanship on these people in certain situations. Because Jake is a very arrogant, conceited, judgmental person. For a guy who does a lot of terrible shit to people, he's very elitist in a way. You know, I don't want to be with the mafia. I'm gonna do it my way. And but here he is controlling this young girl and and um, making her fear or fear for her life at times. Well, the you know the to say that Jake has double standards is like an understatement. I mean, yeah. the, 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 he's all over the place. You're talking about a guy. So, so what? She was talking on your behalf. She was on my behalf. She was talking about a pretty kid. She's saying he's good looking. What are you talking about? And I love and I, a I love Joey's line, and it also yep. is predicting what's going to happen. He says, "So you make him ugly. What's the difference?" <laughs> exactly. And then Joey says, hey, let's, why don't you go make up with her and we'll take her out and you have a nice, you know, wine and diner before we would go. And then as Jake goes to say this to Vicky, he says, Listen, don't, don't, if you tell her now, put me on the side, don't say nothing in front of my lord. Because I'm not taking her. And I'm reminded of the, you know, fr- you know Saturday night at the Copa yeah. was for, for wives. Friday night was for girlfriends. Yeah, exactly. Like, and because you know the double standard of like, yeah, of course we can be married and have our girlfriends, but if she says anything, you yeah, know, that's that's big trouble. And then we see what we're going to see later in a more disturbing way, which is he goes to Jake goes to the other room, the babies are there, Lenora's there, and he tries to kind of kiss her, and she's obviously pissed, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then he gets sort of on top of her, 
Mm-hmm. And then she starts to laugh. You know what I mean? It's like, like he persuades her. Right. But in a way that's forceful. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Which is what he does even at the end. Yeah. So I don't know that this guy learned a goddamn thing by the end of the movie, you know? Yeah. I don't, I, I don't think he did. Mm. Um, he learned some lines from Shakespeare and how to do the, the, the monologue from uh, on the waterfront. Well, it's, I'm, I'm saying all this because as, as you did, like I went and read some people's analysis and some people like he has, he learns, he's grown as a human. There's retro, there's, he's, he's advanced himself. There's retro. I'm like, what are you all talking about? He's still the same hard headed loser that he is throughout the movie at the end. You just feel sympathy because he's old and he's overweight and he's lost the connection with his brother or whatever. But, you know, he forces the resolution with his brother. Joey at the whole time is like, get off me, get away. I don't want to do this, blah, blah, blah. But Jake won't let him go. That's him forcing himself on Joey. There is no difference. There's no difference. People need to understand that. You don't get to seek closure because you want to get closure. That's not how it fucking works. You go to the person you seek closure from. You request the opportunity to have closure. If they say no, guess what? You're fucked. You're shit out of luck. And so you're just going to have to come to terms with it on your own. If you force the closure to happen, you've learned nothing, not a fucking thing, because you've been selfish yet again to get the closure that you want. So this, even this moment is a microcosm of what's going to come later. He's a guy who forces people to try to meet him in a certain place. And if they can't, he gets upset about it. And as Vicky Lamata to- says in her book, this behavior continued all the way past Raging Bull, the movie coming out. So he didn't really learn much lessons from this whole situation and even the movie. You know? Well, th- th- that scene is fascinating. Obviously, we're, we'll, we'll get to it, but like, yeah. he doesn't say, I'm sorry. No. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be back at the Copa Lounge. What a great audience. Come on, lady, laugh it up. I laugh when you come in. <laughs> We are back at the Copa, and it's just so strange to be at the Copa Cabana in this film in the late right. 40s when we were at the Copa Cabana in the late 60s in the other film, you know, in Goodfellas. And there's a comedian there, it's Bernie Allen, he's, he's making the jokes, and then he says, I'd like to introduce the world's leading middleweight contender, the Bronx Bull, the Raging Bull. Let's hear for the great Jake LaMotta, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> stands up and he waves and we're with it's just so weird that because it's not just that joey brought his girlfriend it's that jake brought his wife and joey brought his girlfriend right that's fucked up (laughs) but here he is worried about her cheating or uh, jake is worried about her cheating on him but he is quite all right with joey doing it so again the patriarchal approach to the relationships i can cheat but you better not cheat. And it's like, that's such bullshit, you know, when you see that. And it still goes on to this day. There are many men who are suspicious of their significant others in straight relationships who cheat on their own wives and girlfriends and significant others, but get super paranoid or super fucking upset if they were to do the same thing. And it's such a an arrogant misogyny, uh, you know, when you see that from certain men. So, And, and you're seeing it here. You absolutely see it here. Vicky gets up to says she's going to the bathroom and she goes right to Sal and yeah. kisses Sal. And again, we're in this, the camera is pushing in on them as Jake watches. And we're just in his perspective. Sal comes up in slow motion towards yeah. Jake offers a handshake. What do you think about the way De Niro shakes Sal's hand? Oh my God. It's, it's very kind of tossed off, you know? Yeah. It is yeah. very uh, limp. It yeah. is not a respectful handshake. And uh, and then we're at the moment like, and, and De Niro, uh, Scorsese loves to do this, which is we see Sal actually reach across Jake's face, I think, to shake hands with Joey or something. Yeah. Yeah. And, but Jake's face stays in focus, yep. you know, and it's just all of these little touches he does. And we mentioned that Tommy Como's there. And, right. and again, it's that weird slow motion, interesting angle push in on Tommy from... Jake's perspective, and there we have Nicholas Colasanto. Hmm. Coach. It's coach. I mean, it's just what's so funny. Yeah. I saw I had watched Cheers, I'm fairly certain, before I saw this movie. Yeah, okay. Yeah, fair point. I'm sure. You I know, and so yeah. seeing him in this context after seeing him loving him in that context yeah. is just 
Yeah. yeah how it do makes you feel it even more it? of a loss because he's oh. so good in this role. Yeah. You know, he's playing a mafia guy and he is yeah. completely believable. So that when you see him as coach, which is this bumbling, good natured older guy uh, at the bar and cheers, you're like, this is a really good actor who I should have seen in way, way many more things. And so the fact that he died, which I would argue is kind of young, uh, I think he was in his 60s, it's a fucking yeah. shame. We lost more time with him where he could have been in a number of these feature films through the 80s and 90s and delivered even more memorable performances, you know. And from what I've learned or what I read about him is mm. that he struggled. I mean, he was a mm. working actor, theater director. Oh, but you know, like it was always a struggle. And it, what's so funny is Cheers premieres in 1982. It's yes. only a couple of years after this. Right. You know, right. like, and I agree with you. I think he's fantastic. I think he's like, in a weird way, a precursor to Pauly Cicero. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, kind of. Yeah. He's got yeah. sort of a, the, that sort of quietness to him. He's yep. not aggressive about it. Um, yeah, I think he's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, S- Sal brings Vicky over to Tommy. And one of the interesting choices he made, the video, the film is in slow motion. But the audio is in normal speed. Right. Which is one of those choices that shouldn't work, but it totally does. And of course, Jake is just studying them. And it's also, we say hello to Charlie, which is Charles Scorsese. And this is the first of the major movies that he acted in for his son. Yeah, yeah. And they make jokes about Jake as she goes away. And then Jake essentially interrogates her. What were you talking to Sal before? And he asked me if Joe was there. I said he's over there. And he said Tommy's over there wanting to go sell him. And I did. I didn't see that. It's so, man, I know, I'm sure you've had the conversation with a person who's kind of gone round the bend. Yeah. Where you're like, oh, we're not going to get anywhere here. Because his response, yeah. she clearly says she's not interested in him. And he goes, I was you're not interested in him, but you could be interested in somebody. Yeah, I had this uh, in a relationship, I think in my 20s or 30s, late 20s, early 30s with someone, I can't remember her name, but like we went together for a few months and then there was all of a sudden these questions about my friends, my female friends and questions about this or that. And so you can't win. You can't win because no matter what you say, this person has invested in the narrative and they think you're trying to hide stuff from them. And nothing you say, and the more passionate you get in your defense, and I'm a passionate guy by nature, as you know, right. it makes you seem even more guilty to them. So right. there's no winning. There's literally no, no winning. Because if you give them nothing, then they think you're hiding something. And if you give them too much, then they think you're uh, being overly defensive. So you are hiding something. So it's just like, it's the worst. Uh, and it goes both ways, just to be fair. Both man, men and women do this to oh, each yeah. other. And it's, it can be quite a difficult situation to be in, for God's sakes. Well, and we're going to see an extreme example of what you describe of if you get, give them nothing, it gets worse. If you get passionate, yes. it gets worse. That's coming. That's exactly yeah. where we're going to go. For sure. Waiter delivers some drinks from Tommy Como. Great reaction from Jake. And I'll, and it's just, you know, these are the little details. But the fact that the waiter says, should I take this? And he goes, I'm not through with it. Yeah. I know it's a totally nothing moment, except it isn't because it's yeah. it's about him keeping his independence from Tommy Como in this yes. way. And Joey goes over to Tommy's table. Again, there's greetings, there's kisses. Um, and Tommy raises his glass and points to it. Jake toasts back. They gesture for him to come over. And finally, Jake is going to have to go over to that table. Yeah. I, I love the little bit of guilt that he drops back on is that Tommy starts with. He ain't never coming around anymore. You can't even make a call. What is it? Oh, I'm busy. I'm going away fighting. I'm busy. I'm busy. 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 Look at him taking me seriously. I'm, a, I'm only kidding you. What a fucking kid. He wasn't only kidding him. No, of course not. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, talk about the fight. They talk about the Gennaro fight. Well, he's no piece of cake. That's a good fight. Very attractive guy. Only girls like him. No marks. Clean. Sal calling Gennaro attractive. <laughs> it's almost like he knows that that's what's going to go, Jake. You know? Right. Right. There, there's no way he could know that. And now Tommy wants to basically get a prediction on the fight of whether or not he should bet on him. And he says, I always say bet everything you got. Everything. Everything. Because I'm going to open this hole like this. Excuse my French girl. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, Jake, who can be as uncharismatic as possible, yeah. as, be- as you could imagine, suddenly there's like charisma and energy coming off of him. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. As he talks about what he's going to do to him. I mean, I don't know. I got a problem. I should fuck him a fight. <laughs> 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 fuck him a fight. 
Yeah, you really love looking for this kid. Watch out. By who? Geneva. You mean you want me to get him to fuck you? I don't know, but I feel like this was an improv. Oh. I, I really don't know. I have no evidence of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I love, I love Frank Vincent, the way he goes. Me? Yeah. No, I don't want to fuck me. It's very straight. You know what I mean? He's like, I don't know what to say, but I'm going to counter it as nicely as possible. So I don't get into this because he might, he might set, it might set him off. I can do that easily. How are you going to do that? Because I'll get you his boat in the ring. I'll give you his boat a fucking beat and you both can fuck each other. Ah, yeah. What's, what's going on here? What's, what's happening? Well, this is dude's being dudes and this is one guy who is absolutely feeling superior to the other guy and essentially castrating him in front of everybody verbally yeah uh and that's that happens and i certainly i've seen it happen and certainly this moment uh is very clear that he is i would not jealous but he's super fucking mad that vicky is still friends with this guy remember she met he met her and saw her First with Sal, and Sal's connected to Tommy, and so he's always felt that Sal uh, was a lower guy, and so you see that he just has a hatred for Sal and what he represents. So the fact that Vicky would even be mentioned or would even talked about or would even be part of Sal's crew, it's always bothered him. And so in this moment here, uh, he is essentially um, emasculating him in front of everybody because he knows he can. You know, it's funny. I, I I'm not making any comments on whether or not Sal is a good guy. He's obviously mm. part of the mob. I don't know what Sal's intentions towards Vicky were. I don't know anything about, about what's really going on with Sal. I feel bad for Sal in this movie, <laughs> you know, hey, man, a lot of stuff want, happens beyond his control. <laughs> you want to walk in these circles? Uh, you yeah, know. no, no, it's fair. Yeah. It's totally fair. Yeah. We're back at home. It's nighttime. Vicky's asleep in the bed. It's beautifully lit as everything in this film is beautiful shadows. The big cross that is over their bed is the cross that was on the wall above Marty's parents' bed. Yeah. And the night before this shoot, he just swiped it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Jake comes in. I think this is where he's at his best. This is where he fascinates me the most in this film mm. when he's doing almost nothing, when he's not speaking, when he's just, just his quietness, just him looking at her in the bed. I find fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you wonder what he's thinking, right? What are the thought processes in that moment? She's asleep. Yeah. He does not have to bring this up with her right now. Dude. Again, because this is Jake LaMotta and he must have his needs met when he wants his needs met. He is going to wake her up to have this conversation with her half awake and hammer this point home with her because he can't let it go. Like we've said, he gets obsessed by little things and he cannot let it go. You ever think anybody else? I want him bed. Jesus. So, first of all, <laughs> my advice to those young lovers out there, <laughs> never ask this question. Yes. First of all. Unless, unless you're ready for the answer, don't ask this fucking question. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it's like, I mean, if you have a completely kind of open polyamorous sort of relationship and you, and this is all fine with you. Sure. You can have this conversation, but if you have even the tiniest bit of jealousy, don't ask and definitely don't wake someone up in the middle of the night when they're half asleep and ask this question. I mean, you know, like, oh, I want make love. Uh, oh. I love you. And there's a pause. And then he says, how come you said that thing about Janeiro? Oh my God. What did I say? You said you had a pretty face. I noticed this face. And this is where you believe her. Do you think yeah. he has, says and I don't. I think she she did see that he was good looking. It slipped out when she was talking about him, and now she's gotta bring it back because otherwise it's gonna be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And he says, go to sleep. And De Niro turns and looks forward. And this is what I mean of just watching him in silence. Yeah. Is astounding. Yeah. And, and it's funny, like this is the magic of film acting, is and there was a quote, which is from Orson Welles, um, where Orson said that someone asked him, you know, what's the difference between, or said like, oh, the difference between theater acting is, and film acting is that theater is big and film is small. Right. And he's like, first of all, that's not true. You can be big in film, you can be small in theater. That's, that's not true. Right. And then they said, well, you know, isn't the camera kind of like a telescope or a magnifying glass? And he said, no, that is not what the camera is. The camera is an X-ray machine. It sees truth. 
Wow. That's a great answer, dude. Isn't it? And, Holy shit, that's a great answer. And I think this moment of just watching the camera, watching Robert De Niro, this is where you see it's an x-ray machine. You're you're looking into him in this way, you know? Yep, yep, 100% agree with that. Wow. And then we go right from there, hard cut, right into the fight, close up of De Niro just getting hit. <laughs> and again, each fight has a different stylistic yep. concept. The concept for this fight is Scorsese wanted to show what it felt like to fight against Jake LaMotta. Yeah. And it, uh, spoiler alert, it does not feel good. No. And it is like, you know, const- it's just a barrage, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and he's beating the shit out of him and that it's very clear that he is pretty much out. Yeah. And Jake is not letting him go down. He's right. keeping him up to continue with beating Back to the sound thing. I want to explain one more thing about how this sound was done. Mm. Because this is done before the world of digital things. There's no computers. Every piece of sound is on a little strip of magnetic tape that has a little label on it. And so when he's layering in seven animals or car crash, whatever the fuck he's doing to create yeah. the, each one of these punches, he has little tiny tapes that he puts on the moviola. The moviola is the device that you had a film on. And so you have the film running through this thing. Mm. And then you are syncing up five different kinds of sounds with the moviola by hand. Wow. And then what he did was he didn't want the speed always to be the same. So sometimes when he's rolling it through, he's speeding up the moviola manually because he's just turning a crank or Mm -hmm. slowing it down by hand, which means none of these punches, nothing could ever be reproduced. It was just this way that he did it right then. And I'm telling you, when I learned how to cut sound, this is how I learned how to do it because I I'm like the last generation that learned how to edit film on a moviola. Right. And like the time it takes just to lay in a door close or something, you know, that took me 25 minutes to get it in sync and put it in the thing. And, to, you know, and, and like to cut, you're literally cutting with scissors to your piece of sound to move it around and listening. It took, took forever. It is a painstaking and brutal process. So what this guy is doing, it is insane what he's doing for every single moment of this film craziness man yeah craziness wow by the way when he was done he mm-hmm. took all those sounds that he recorded because these are all things he went out to record yeah. you know they're not from a sound library he took all these sounds and you want to know what he did with them he burnt them he destroyed them all <laughs> what? why so he didn't want anybody to imitate didn't want anyone to steal them he didn't Shut want and fuck up. Wow. well and it's like i remember i know like mark Marin when he does a records a special he yep. goes okay all of those bits are retired i have to start from scratch yeah, this is what this guy wanted to do. He doesn't want any one of his movies to ever sound like another one of his movies. So every time you got to start completely over. <sighs> That's incredible. It's a hell of a task you put on yourself. Yep. The a shot- masochist himself, I think. But yeah, that's why. But this is, I mean, this is, if there was one lesson I would want people who have listened to the cinephiles to get, yeah. it's that making great movies is really fucking hard work. Yes. True. It's brutal long hours, attention to detail. It is just really, really, really hard. Yeah. You know, the shot of Gennaro's nose getting broken (laughs) and the blood squirting out is just so nasty and so incredible. And I, we'd never seen anything like this on film ever before this, to this extent. Yeah. And then an incredible slow-mo shot as he goes down. Yeah. One of the other interesting choices is unlike the other fights where we had the announcer's commentary, we don't really have that here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're watching everyone else reacting to what Jake is doing to this kid. Well, that was my next question is there's the cut to Vicky watching this. What, what do you think? What is she feeling? As I think some absolute fear is what you, well, this is what I'm reading on her face because her making that offhand comment is what led to Jake doing this at least that's implied right she's not to blame let's make it clear she's not to blame but because jake is a nutball uh or that's a technical term uh (laughs) you know he takes this he takes this um slight uh that perceived slight shall we say and takes his anger out on this kid and destroys him and you see everyone reacting to it that there's he's an animal and they're all reacting to this in a way that's like wow they know what he's doing, you know, and it's a small area of New York and I'm sure, you know, people talked or whatever people heard the story. So 
they're all invested in watching this. And so watching him do what he does, it's so brutal. It's so um, um, terrible that everyone is turned off by it. You know, so once again, Jake being his own worst enemy, not yeah. understanding the situation, allowing his anger to rule the day and it, and it absolutely blowing up in his face. Yep. And Tommy says, it ain't pretty no more. And then this is what I find really interesting. We go from the fight yeah. to in through the steam, we see Jake exercising and sweating to take off the weight. And what I realized, I don't know if I ever really thought this before. It's like, oh, this is from right before that fight. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this is him c cutting the weight in order to make it to 155 to have this fight. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had to cut weight for anything? Mm, I mean, y yes and no, in that like I took on this when I was doing CrossFit for three years, way, way, way back in the, what, uh, two th 2010s or something like that. I, I signed up for a program so that I would be on keto. And so I did keto for like six months leading to a competition that mm. we had within the CrossFit gym. So it wasn't about cutting the weight necessarily, but it was about cutting out certain foods. And so that made my weight precipitously drop. I increased my strength. And so I was able to compete. I got down to 211, which is the lowest I'd ever been since I got out of the military in when I was 18 at 195. So like that was the lowest I'd ever been in a very long time. So I was cutting the weight, but not on purpose. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But watching this movie, and I brought this up with the lady outlaw, and she said, I don't think you can make this happen. It's dangerous, but maybe. We are so obsessed with weight loss in this country, and 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 rightfully so, because this these foods that they they make now, they, you know, and I just saw KFC as a new thing they're doing um with the with the chicken breast being used not even as a sandwich anymore like as the as the buns of a sandwich now it's something else they're doing that's even more insane to make you die from a heart attack <laughs> yeah all these all these foods that we have in our lives um have made us gain weight right and it, it was and, and back 20 years ago we weren't eating these kinds of foods it's become more processed even more processed and more addictive for people. And so I thought to myself, wouldn't it be interesting if you could create a gym where like if you had to lose weight for a reunion or a wedding or anything, that you could cut weight right before this event. So people would sign up to be a part of this process and would come into the uh, this business that I own and they would be monitored by medical professionals the whole time while they lost like 20 pounds of water weight just before their big premiere or their wedding or their whatever. And they were nursed back to health by the amount of, by the kind of food they were eating. So they wouldn't be like, there wouldn't be a drop off of energy and there wouldn't be an increase of weight right afterwards. So I was thinking to myself, if that's possible to market an idea like that, because people are so obsessed with losing weight for yeah. certain things, you know? So it occurs to me that not only could you and I do an entire cinephile short, but we could do a cinephile's long <laughs> giant on just weight because absolutely I've had my weight loss journey, you mm -hmm. know, for 40 years, you know, yes. I've been Agreed. getting Same. fat and then getting thinner and then getting fat again. And, you know, now I'm on way govy and like learning about all that stuff. So like, we could, I don't know if anyone's interested. Yeah, I think but, a lot of people are interested uh, to hear us talk about it because I'm sure they've struggled with their weights as well. Their weight I know well. people who were like wrestlers and things like that who did have yeah. to cut weight. And so I knew some of the stuff. And so the one time, you know, like, like chewing on Starburst and make enough saliva to then keep spitting in order to yeah. cut weight. So you remember back in like two mid 2000s when I lost 80 pounds, you know, yes. and that was when I got really skinny. That's the most weight I'd ever lost. Yeah. And I was doing Weight Watchers and you get weighed in and mm -hmm. I was desperate to get to quote unquote goal weight. So I wouldn't eat anything in the morning. And it's just how crazy I was at the time. I was like, of I have course. to get to this weight. And so I would ride my bike to Glendale mm -hmm. to on my way there without drinking any water. And then I would spit a bunch before I would, I literally was remembering the cutting weight things I knew from friends who'd have been on wrestling teams yeah. to try to make the fucking weight. And it was so fun. And I, and what's so funny is I did get to the skinniest I'd ever been, which was 198 pounds. And I never want to be that weight again. It was like, I was working out six days a week, yeah. huge, long workouts, barely eating anything. And that was what was necessary to get to that place. And it's just, it's crazy what we put ourselves through.
Oh no, hundred percent. I mean, I back in 2016, um, when I went through the suicide stuff, like I lost a shit ton of weight because I wasn't eating anything, and I got down to like 215, and I loved how I looked. Yet I was the most depressed I'd ever been in my life, which is the irony because. You know, a majority of my life, I've been, you know, chubby to slightly over to overweight. That is, be real, chubby to overweight, right? When I came out of the military, I was in great shape, maintained that for a few years, but then I couldn't, I didn't exercise as much and started eating and enjoying and drinking and all of that kind of stuff. And so the weight came back on. So through the 2000s, it was like, okay, let me find this. Okay, CrossFit, keto, I'll do this. Oh, I'm super depressed. I, I, I ate one meal a day for like months, for like four months, I ate one meal a day. Because I was so depressed that I wasn't hungry for anything else, um, and I was working at Universal Studios at the same time doing the Harry Potter stuff. They had to, they had to build a whole new costume for me, which they were super pissed about because I'd lost so much weight. Because that wow. was a very expensive costume sure. to make, and so um, that had that situation, you know. But now I'm back up to around two fifty, two fifty five, which is I'm ashamed of how much I weigh now, but. You know, it, I'm an older person now. It's a little harder to 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 make the work. It's effort. way harder. Yeah. So you've got to kind of figure out how can I be comfortable with this, but still work hard at getting myself back into a shape that I feel okay with. So it's those kinds of things. So you see it. But the, the cut weight stuff. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Steve. What were you saying? Well, I was just going to say, I just hope you, you don't uh, resort to depression as, an, as a diet tool. I, no, I never want to do that again. That was the worst. So no. But having watched, um, I just recently watched a great documentary. I love watching uh, boxing and MMA documentaries. Yeah. And I was watching one on Tatiana Suarez that's on HBO Max. Um, and there is a whole sequence, a scene of her cutting weight to make this big fight. And what you go through. And Conor McGregor had a series. And however you feel about Conor McGregor, I totally respect you, hate or like him, whatever. The series they did on Netflix, there is a whole like 10, 15 minute sequence of him cutting weight and being put in this like hyperbaric chamber and being put into these. And just, and you see that when they're losing this weight, they cross this line into absolutely being completely out of it, like out of it. Uh, And you see these massive, powerful fighters all of a sudden become very weak-willed and barely can move and can barely form sentences or words. And um, the people monitoring have to put in, you know, the salt tablets or give them a little bit of water or whatever she said to to the Starburst for saliva. You see all of that. So it is fa- – and there's just pools of sweat on the fucking ground. It is crazy what these people do just to be able to fight in these fights, you know. And, and to be really clear – this is so terrible for you. I mean, oh, this of course is it is horrible on your body. But I also think, that, and to, just to get back to the movie after this <laughs> digression, but I, to, but I also think there is almost, and I think throughout this film, there's almost a religious aspect to mm-hmm. the suffering that Jake goes through in order to make his weight. You know, and the yeah, way yeah. it's treated, the way it's lit. Um, we're back at the Copa. By the way, the bar that is in this place was actually the bar from the Copa, the original Copacabana and yeah. the bartender serving drinks was the bartender from the Copacabana. Oh, wow. Nice. And uh, Joey's there. Jake's not there. And he's talking to some guys about fights. And I don't think any of this dialogue is particularly important. Mm. The guy he's talking to is Peter Savage, who wrote the original book, uh, Raging Bull with Jake LaMotta. Oh, interesting. Okay. And, and as he's talking to them, and I think Joe Pesci plays this so well, mm. is that he's talking to them and in comes Vicky in a white mink with Sal. And what Pesci does so beautifully is that he continues to talk to them. Yeah. And it is very clear that he is trying to make it look like he's still paying attention to them when he isn't paying attention to them at all. Yeah. Like Jake, he is now laser focused on Vicky. Yeah. Um, By the way, Jake really did tell Joey, his brother to watch Vicky when he was out of town. No surprise. No fucking surprise. Joey walks up to the table where Sal is, and he just takes Vicky away. Shut up. Just shut up. Both of you must say, you know that I feel like I'm a prisoner. I can't walk. I look at somebody the wrong way. I get smacked. And I, this is where, like, clearly Jake has hit her multiple times at, by yes. this point in the film. Yeah. And Joey fully takes Jake's side. You think you're right or something, boy? You're fucking yelling? Yeah, you're I wrong. Am right. No, you're wrong. Look, I am right. I'm tired of having to turn around and having both of you up my ass all the time. How, how do you feel? Uh, how am I going to ask this question? How, how 
how do you feel about what Joey, how Joey is handling it? How do you, is there some other way that Joey should handle it? Like what, yeah, what not, should happen here? Not say a fucking word and trust her. That's the other way that uh, Joey could have handled it. But you know, again, this is a patriarchal uh, society and, and uh, culture. And so at, especially at that time. And so when he's it, never mind that this is uh, Joey being hypocritical as fuck. Cause he was oh, just sure. out with someone who was not his wife and asked Vicky to not say a word about it and Jake not say a word about it. And here he is being upset because Vicky happens to go out with a group of people, right? She's not on a date with a one-on-one situation. She's out with a group of people, her hometown friends, the people she knows and has grown up with. So she's going out for a night on the town, right? While Jake's not home. Okay. Tommy could have handled, or sorry, Joey could have handled it so differently in how he approached this, but him like, saying the things he says or berating her. And then I think he smacks her. You know, it's like when Jake beats the shit out of Joey, I used to feel so terrible about it. But watching the movie now as an older person and watching all this for our show, I didn't feel sympathy for Joey at all because fuck him. Like he is part of this patriarchal structure trying to keep her down, trying to keep women from speaking, God forbid, speaking their minds. And he is part of encouraging the violence within Jake. Because remember, we're getting to that scene where he says to him, you should just kick her to fuck out, smack her and kick her to fuck out, right? But here he is in this sequence, smacking another man's wife. Like, what? Like this kind of thing here, you see him feeling some superiority to her um, because she is a woman, because she is the wife of his brother. He feels that he can do these things to her that violate the human code. And so I don't feel sympathy for this clown. And so when things happen to him, I don't feel sympathy for him. And I used to, when I watched the movie and now I don't, you know, it's, it's Vicky who comes out of this thing, uh, looking uh, like the person I want to sympathize and care about, uh, throughout this whole movie. You know? So I halfway 100% agree with you. <laughs> so you 50% agree with me. That's not what I said. <laughs> so, you said halfway 100%. That feels look, like the, 50, but okay. The math is complicated. I, I don't have time. To, I'd have to draw it out for you. I'm not there good you know. with new math. So, <laughs> so uh, of course, all of the patriarchal things, all of the, you know, getting up in the face of your brother's wife, her not having any freedom, uh, totally, I sign with, side with Vicky. I 100% agree. Right. The thing that's in my brain is I go, how dangerous at this point does joey think his brother is and and i think part of what he is happening Mm -hmm. is he has seen the violence that could happen because of this incident sure you know like that she like regardless of that 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 vicky by coming out particularly coming out with sal in a public place is playing with fire that could really really blow up and well and the other thing too is jake is joey's meal ticket you know, like right. there's there's things about beyond, obviously, again, that's why I say I totally agree with you. Vicky is in this abusive, terrible situation. She's 20 years old. She's just trying to have a life. Yeah. And for Joey to come down on her the way he does is terrible. I totally agree with that. But I also am just and this is where I go is like, we're going to see just how dangerous Jake is. But how much does Joey know how dangerous Jake is yeah. at this point? You know, right. And that's fair. So Joey should come from a different place of like that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. The different approach is not is the different approach is more like you know what's happening. You know what he's gonna do if he finds out about this. Everyone's gonna talk. Aren't you worried about this? Aren't you worried about what he might do to the kids? Like, let's just come with me. I get it. You wanna break out. I totally respect that. We'll figure something out. Let's get out of here because this isn't the way. You're gonna piss him off even more. Then she has a choice. Exactly. Then there's a possibility, yeah. right? But the way he's doing it is essentially as possessive as Jake. Oh, yeah. That's There's exactly what it is. Yeah. Well, and this, again, when I looked at people that do see ambiguity or 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 other things is that there are people that say Joey's reaction here is because he is, attra- is into Vicky, that it's not about what? Jake's jealousy, that really? this is about Joey's jealousy. That's that- nonsense. That's nonsense. Well, I mean, but this is the- you I know- can't agree with it. I'm sorry. I can't agree with this, what I'm saying, yeah. Well, this is the thing. It's like that, you know, like there is ambiguity in this film. I I see it the way you do. Like mm-hmm. I but 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 I but it is interesting to me when other people see things differently. I love the dialogue here. I think Kathy Moriarty, she just plays this so real. This just yeah. feels real to me. And what am I supposed to do? When 20 years old, I gotta go home and sleep by myself every night. What the fuck did you marry? Because I love her. You do? 
Joey's shock at her saying she loves him is really interesting to me. And then she says, and I think this is an amazing line. Dude, I love him. What am I supposed to do? This guy don't even want to fuck me. And the, the demure, I will call it a demure look from yeah. Kathy Moriarty after she voiced that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think that that is a deep truth that came out of her that is totally inappropriate for a woman to say. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. people yeah. didn't talk yeah. like that. Yeah. And so her saying this to the brother is like a real admission of a thing. And then Joey says, he's just been a contender too long. He'll be all right as soon as he gets his shot and everything will be okay. Boy, is that not the fucking truth. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Things are not going to be okay. No, it's going to be worse. He says, get your stuff. You know, we're back at the table and Sal is trying to settle things down. Joey, come on. Shut up. Shut up. Mind your fucking business and shut up. You're taking this all wrong, Joey. I said shut up. And this is, I just like, Sal, what is up? Like, because- this is taking out another man's wife in a public place who you oh, yeah. know is a violent person. Yeah. You know, like this isn't what Sal is doing is not okay. Yeah. Um, even if we even if we feel bad for Vicky. Yeah. Sal, Sal knows what he's doing for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Joy breaks a glass. Big reaction. Vicky's heading out. And then there's this moment where Pesci is sort of putting his hands out like this. Okay, relax. It's all calm. You know, let's settle down now. He says, I'm just upset. You know, it's my brother's wife. Relax. And Sal goes, nothing's going on. And then Joey leans in and grabs a glass and smashes it into Sal's face. Good friends, we can straighten this. (laughs) So first of all, the extras didn't know this was going to happen. No, the only people that knew this was going to happen was Marty and Frank Vincent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank Vincent said he wouldn't have let any other actor other than Joe Pesci, who he's close friends with, to do this thing. Yeah, of course. Um, the guy that comes to pull them apart, cause they just go nuts. They just go at it. Right. Is actually a real bou- bouncer. <laughs> Some of the extras here had been to the Copa in this era. And when this oh. is going on, they went, Oh, it just seems like old times. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and what happens next is just crazy. So yeah. first of all, they're just brawling. And then Pesci ends up outside. Sal comes through the restaurant. His face is bleeding. Joey is next to the door and hits him with like the velvet rope thing as he comes yeah. through. And then there's a shot of him lifting it up. Like he's hitting Sal's out of frame. Like he swings down and hits down on him. Did he hit him with that big? Oh, totally did. Of course he hit him with that. And then as the fight goes on, drags him out there and takes the door. Vinny Jones from a guy, Ritchie film style. Yeah. And just starts destroying him on the door. So again, now if you want to analyze this movie, as we're doing, look at this beat down. He administers to Sal. Who, look, by all accounts, he has made one move on Vicky in the movie that we've seen. Not one fucking move has he made on Vicky in the whole film. Does he like to be, you know, around beautiful women and brings her? Sure, absolutely. Is he playing with fire? Sure, absolutely. But look what Joey does to Sal. It mirrors what Jake does to Joey later. It mirrors the ferocity, the violence, the unhinged violence. But because you go, oh, well, that's brother to brother, it's more more heartbreaking. Fuck no. This is human to human. And that is a horrible thing that he's doing to Sal. But uh, this is why I say uh, I feel bad for Sal. I mean, I'm not saying yeah, Sal's a good I, I don't guy. disagree with you in this sequence, for sure. This, this is nuts what's happening. But, yeah. um, the slamming his head in the cab and the woman screaming in there. I mean, Joey has completely lost his mind. Right. Um, and he gets away with it. He jumps over the cab and gets away. What the yeah. fuck? Well, and the other thing is Sal's part of the mob. <laughs> Yeah. Like, this is not smart. I love, by the way, there's a little moment inside where a couple of the other wise guys are like talking to the bouncer and, and they, they say something about Tommy and the bouncer goes, don't mention Tommy. You do what you do. We do what we got. Like trying to speak logic to these guys. It's hilarious. Little moment. Don't do that. No, no. You understand our job is here. We got to do this. You, you, you did this. You guys started this. We got to kick you out. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Such a great little moment of comedy. And after this complete violent chaos, it's rainy. We're hearing classical music and we're at the debonair social club and we move inside. And again, it's the, those little shots of all the details, the coffee cups and the boiling water Mm -hmm. and the dishes and the cards. And, and there's Tommy. And he says, And you've done a lot of things together. I understand, Joey. It was your brother's wife, but you don't raise your hand. 
You don't create a scene like that in a place like that. Now, we've heard everybody's point of view here, and we're going to forget about it. I should forget about it, but we're going to forget about it. I think if Jake was not a fighter that they want to use, Joey's dead. I think if Joey didn't know that right. Jake was a fighter that they wanted to use, Joey wouldn't have gone on as unhinged as he as he went on Sal. He knew he had the ace in the hole with Jake. So when you have this sequence here, I 100% agree with you. You know, And Joey is still pissed because Joey does the hard handshake and the hard hug on purpose. Yes. He's, he's like, yeah, I'll do the bridge of peace with you, but you still took out my brother's wife and I feel I have the right to do this to you, you know, even though he doesn't. Well, and when he does that hug and Sal goes, I'm sorry, I forgot all about it. Am I fucking nuts? Kill him. It's like Sal got a conversation with Tommy and I think Tommy yeah. said to Sal, look, normally we would take Joey out. We would do it to, but in this case, you're going to have to eat shit because we want to get this fighter because Sal walking out is just not pleased. And then he wants Joey to stay. So Joey stays. And now we start talking about Jake. Listen to me. Now, Jake, the guy has become an embarrassment. He's embarrassing me with certain people. And I'm looking very bad. Who are certain people? The mafia, yeah. right? The mob, the people yeah. hooked up there. And, and the, yeah. I can't deliver a kid from my own goddamn neighborhood. What is it with him? Why does he have to make it so hard on himself? For Christ's sake, he comes to me and make it easier for him. The man's got a head of rock. And he tries to, he's trying to walk this line of saying that Jake respects him, but he has to do his own thing. And Tommy comes down pretty hard on him. Now you do this for me, you understand? You tell him. I don't care how colorful he is. How great he is. He could beat all the Sugar Ray Robinsons and the Tony Janeiros in the world, but he ain't going to get a shot at that title, not without us, he ain't. So that's it. So we've now laid down the law. Yep. Very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. No longer pleasantries and small yeah. talk. Here's the fucking deal. Once and for all. Yeah. From my mouth. You want a title shot? Yeah. All. Yeah. We're back at the pool. It's pouring rain. And I don't know. Did Jake just come to the pool to look at where he met Vicky? Probably. That's what I, this guy's a fucking nut. Again, technical term. I know she's doing something. I just want to catch her once. Just once. This is some stuff. And this is what you were talking about. Hey, Jack. Want to do yourself a favor? Bust that fucking hole, throw her out. Either that or live with her and let her ruin your life. Because that's what's happening. What he doesn't say is you're crazy or you're wrong or... Yes. Treat her better. This is all your fault. You're a fucking moron. Yeah. Get some help for God's sakes. You know, it's, it's because of course you're, I mean, you know, obviously you're asking for enlightened mental health approach to things from guys in the 1950s who are involved in pugilism. So maybe not the best place to seek it, but certainly, you know, that's the better way out. Joey <laughs> Joe goes, maybe you guys should talk about your feelings more often and maybe seek some, there's, we do some couples <laughs> therapy and maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe ayahuasca would help. I don't know. <laughs> Me and Teresa, we we doing that now. We're talking to somebody. You tell you're telling your feelings. You're talking about me and your sessions. <laughs> That's what it would turn it's into, totally right? right? The the and then we have another one of these long, intense looks from De Niro. And yeah. my question here is: Is he already starting to suspect his brother? Oh, it's a good question. Ooh, I hadn't even considered it because I just think he's lost in his own imaginings of what Vicky is doing, you know? Um, maybe, maybe, because his brother's about to bring him this whole thing of, you know, throwing the fight and whatever. So maybe he starts to suspect that his brother's involved with these guys. And certainly later when he confronts him and says, you, you could have said anybody else. You said yourself with these guys, you know? Well, so maybe. It, it, one of the interesting things to me is sometime – between Sal's head and the cab door. And <laughs> after he wins the title several years from now, Jake yeah. hears about what happened at the Copa. Yes. We don't know when he heard about it. Right. He could have already heard about it. What did that guy say? He gave me the old good news, bad news with me. Good news is you're going to get the shot at the title. And the bad news is they want you to do the old flip flop for him. And I think 
Jake knew this was coming at this point, you know? Yep. That's why he held him off yeah. at arm's length the whole time. He knew he was going to have to do a dive for them. What'd you expect? You didn't know that was coming? Uh, you want some to lose some. This one will lose. <laughs> uh, we cut to the weigh-in against Billy Fox, and then we're in this corridor, and there's Toppy, who's like the fight official, who is played by Frank Tuffin, and he says... Matter of fact, a short time ago, you are a big favorite. And all of a sudden, you're a 12 to 500 dog, and people are talking to something. Why I never heard anything. It's, okay. it's not good. As a matter of fact, smart money is saying that you're getting ready to hit the tank. That's bullshit. Yeah, it's bullshit. And then we just have this long walk down the corridor with Jake and Joey, beautifully lit again, moving in and out of the shadows. And the sound design to me, there's a great sound at the end of this walk that for some reason to me almost it sounds like a death, if you know what I mean. Like like oh. some, tr- tr- I don't know what it is. There's something about the sound that I have no idea what the sound is. That sounds very tragic and, and final to me. And we go into the fight. Yeah. Uh, we see Tommy and Charlie arriving. I, I, the little detail that Tommy asked Charlie to s- switch seats with him is great because it's just a power move. I'm the more right. important person. I get the better seat. Um, And they touch gloves and by the way this is the most traditionally shot fight in the whole movie mm. and Mart scorsese's reason for this is that jake isn't really fighting oh you know it's the one that's not real so he shot it the way right. people shoot movies and fights in movies that's a good point. yeah yeah um good point. and jake moves in ducks one punch hits him with a left cross and billy fox <laughs> is essentially out on his feet <laughs> And Jake now has to hold him up. And the crowd yeah. turns on him and, you know, ends of the round. Billy staggers back to his corner. The, the trainer, Mario, is all over Jake because obviously he's not in on the on throwing the fight. Yeah. Starts again. And then Jake standing there getting hit and not going down. Yeah. It, it, honestly, it looks like Joey hit him harder in that kitchen scene at the beginning of the movie. Like, it looks like just ridiculous. Like, this guy got nothing on him. Yeah. The audience is totally turned on him. Jake, even is he's just like watching the clock to see how long do I have to stand here and get punched, you know? Yeah. It's fun. I mean, I find the scene funny. You know, it's yeah bizarre it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's it's ridiculously funny, yeah. And the uh, the ref calls the fight. They awarded to Billy Fox. And then we cut straight from Billy Fox winning to Jake sobbing on someone's shoulder in the locker room. (laughs) What an interesting scene. And it it causes even his corner man to start crying as well, you know, because it's all shame. This is all shame. This is him. This is him sitting in a priest's rectory after having done honest confession mm. and he is just letting out all his feelings and just crying just uh, just waves of it right because this is coming from a place of shame and also the one place where he had in his mind kept everything pure and been able to do the right thing as a fighter or whatever now that is sullied so now he has no place in his life that isn't sullied by some decision of his to destroy it i think I don't know that this had ever been filmed. What's what, what De Niro is doing here in this moment. Mm. The ju- because, and, and, and it's my aesthetic too. Like in general, I don't want to be just looking in on just pure hundred percent out of control emotion as a filmmaker. Mm. You know what right. I mean? That's why, you know, like we talk about, I like remains of the day where there, <laughs> all the emotion is there, but everything is very restrained. That is more my style as a filmmaker, yeah, which is, it's also my style as, as a human. Right. And what De Niro does is, I'm going to be at a hundred percent out of control, total sobbing, raw, out of control emotion. Yeah. And that's what he's doing. And I think, I almost wonder, you know, when Mario starts crying, when the trainer starts crying, I almost wonder if that just happened because he was watching mm-hmm. De Niro. Mm-hmm. I, I, Cause it's just like, Maybe. what yeah. De Niro's doing here is uh, astounding, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we hear that we see a headline that he's been suspended from boxing, which actually happened. Yep. I take the dive. What more do you want? Huh? You want me to go down too? Well, I ain't going down. I'm going down for nobody. And I love what Joey does here. He says, oh, do, do me a favor. Just put your hands up. And Jake puts his hands up and Joey just takes a dive. What's the, so fucking hard about that? 
By the way, Jake LaMotta in the commentary track said under the same circumstances he would take a dive again. Oh, wow. Yeah. But not go down. Or would he t- go down this time? He did. I don't think he said whether or not he would go down. <laughs> um, and what yeah. Jake says, by the way, is that he could, you know, he, d- he did have to hold him up because if he hadn't hold him up, it's even worse. You know, like, yeah, there wasn't I, anything to do. It would look bad. Um, even worse. Yeah, yeah. And they sit down, they're eating. And I, this moment's really interesting to me is Joey's reassuring. He says, Tommy ain't going to forget us. He's going to get you a shot as long as he don't die. And he, and this is the thing about dealing with crazy people is yeah. this is a nothing comment. And Jake's like, yeah, Wait, yeah. what do you mean? Because yeah, right. Cause crazy people are going to hone in on that. You know, you say one random weird thing and they're like, wait, what's that? What's that mean? What that means something. Why are you saying that? Yeah. Do you know his cancer? What do you do? Yeah. You talk to the doctors. Yeah, exactly. Cut to two years later, the Cadillac hotel in Detroit. And it's, it's raining. And so the first thing we're hearing is that they're having to postpone the fight for 24 hours. Um, we have a couple of guys, corner guys who are like sewing meat to practice, you know, putting stitches on Jake. There's a lot of the first thing that happens. And again, I will say De Niro looks fantastic just in yeah. terms of fitness and health and vitality. 100%. Again, this is the putting a thing in front of a crazy person because there's yeah. just a conversation about, should we order some room service? Vicky, what do you want? Want me a piece of cake? So you want us a piece of cake? Why don't you get a cheeseburger, get French fries, better for you. It's like a home meal. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Let like me one of those. Now, this has no meaning. It has. No, it's not. It's nothing, right? You, it has no meaning. <laughs> but for Jake, <laughs> since when did you order one of those? That's what I know. It's a free country. You order what you want. Don't let nobody influence you. Yeah. The irony of Jake saying that to her. Well, and the person that's influencing him is is Joey, you know? Right, right. Um, but he has spent his whole relationship influencing her and trying to make her of do course. things. Yeah, exactly. So then Jake's lying down on the bed, and there's a knock on the door, and it's Tommy who wants to see him, and Tommy comes in. How are you feeling? I'm feeling all right, Tommy. Thank you. Are you feeling good? I feel as good as I'm going to feel. I got to get in there and fight, then I'm going to feel. All right. And they wish him luck, and everything seems okay, and they start to head out. And Vicky goes to say goodbye. I think this is an incredibly cool choice, which is mm-hmm. we're, wa- Jake, we're in Jake's POV watching Vicky. And yeah. she walks behind a wall. And we track across this wall with his POV until she appears on the other side of the wall. And now she leans in and kisses Tommy. And again, it's all of these POV shots that are mm-hmm. very much from Jake's perspective. And you see like the kiss you see an insert on Joey's hand on his hip and his wedding mm-hmm. ring, I think is very visible. We're watching these hand gestures. We see Joey's hand around Tommy's sh- shoulders. And it's like, yeah. obviously humans can watch other humans and interpret what they're doing and get a sense of it. But yeah. sometimes humans can see a bunch of details that mean nothing and build them into meaning a whole bunch of stuff. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um, And again, by the way, Martin Scorsese, was thinking about that scene that I was describing with the Alka-Seltzer in Taxi Driver when he was filming this sequence. Um, and then Tommy kisses Vicky on the lips. Did you yeah. grow up in a culture where people kissed each other? N- not on the lips. So that's always been a weird thing. Like, I've only ever kissed the people I was dating on the lips, the women I was dating on the lips. And I'm, I don't remember kissing my mom on the lips when I was younger but I probably did as a young child, but I can't remember it other than that time, you know, and I, I would kiss my dad on the cheek or my mom on the cheek. Um, but no, my, so in my world growing up, the, mm-hmm. you know, the Jews of San Francisco, <laughs> Oh, that's a TV series. I've I heard. It's a fantastic <laughs> show. So in the Jews of San Francisco, people kissed each other on the cheek. So my family didn't hug. There wasn't hugging did not get invented as far as I knew until like the mid eighties, you know, <laughs> like my family would, when, when I would see my grandmother, whatever you would kiss on the cheek, not a, not a two kiss. Yeah. What, we weren't French. We were Jews. No, no. One we're kiss okay. on the cheek. <laughs> I have Karen's family kiss. People kissed on the lips, you know? What? Yeah. So there are cultures where kissing on the lips is a normal part of culture. It's, a, yeah. it's just a cultural thing. And it right. seems as if, if Tommy's kissing Vicky on the, it seems like this is just a normal thing, you know? Yes. 
Yeah. She totally. she grew up with Tommy. That's just how people greet each other. And he probably sees her as her grandfather. Like it's yeah. a different situation. Yeah. Well, and he said, well, and it's just exactly as you said, because he goes, look at that face. What a face. And you see the beautiful profile of Vicky. And he says, it's just what a grandfather would say, you know? 100%. And now Vicky turns away and kind of disappears again behind that wall. And Jake has, De Niro has that dead expression on his face. And then to say goodbye, he turns, he smiles suddenly. And he says, oh, okay, goodbye. So long, Tommy. He leaves, calls over Vicky. And, we're, and again, we're in these close quarters. We're in this hallway. Everything's very uh, claustrophobic. Vicky, hey, come here. And you can see in Kathy Moriarty's performance, yeah. she knows the danger signals are up. What's wrong? Oh, what? You know what I'm talking about. What's that about? And Joey knows something is up and he moves forward. And I love the camera kind of pushes past him as he's moving in. It's some of the more kinetic kind of camera moves that we've talked a lot about in Goodfellas. I think these are some of the origins of them. You say goodbye. You, you don't do that. Do? You say hello, you say goodbye, that's all, you hear? And then he slaps her. <gasps> we've talked many times about actual violence and violence towards women in films, like um, Al Pacino striking Diane Keaton in Godfather mm. 2. There was one in a film we just did recently that was pretty brutal. I can't remember what it was. And this is one too, where I'm watching just going, man, how hard is he hitting her? And how many takes yeah. are they doing? And how did they talk about this before, you know, did they yeah. have a conversation that was like, I am going to slap you. And but how, do you feel safe? I don't think so. This is the late seventies. I don't think that's how they're doing things. You know, maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I have no information whatsoever. I haven't heard Kathy Moriarty speak about it at all, uh, mm. but it is definitely scary. Is she on any of the commentary tracks? No. Uh, she's in a couple of the behind the scenes docs, but she's not on the commentary tracks. I that's that's quizzical. Yeah. I would love to hear a poor point of yeah. view on the film and making the film. You hear what I said? You don't ever have any disrespect for me. You hear what I said? You hear what I said? Yeah, yeah. All right, go in there. There's a certain unknowableness of Vicky's character. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. and because I think because Kathy Moretti's voice is so deep and she yeah. says things in such a flat way that you don't, she doesn't let you in that much. Mm -hmm. And then he turns to yell at Joey, and it is fucking scary. Why don't you stop that? Shut I'll up! Stop it! Shut up! Stop. Shut up! I'll fucking take care of you later! Shut up! Disgusting with the two of you. I'll fucking take care of you later, John. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask the question I asked at the pool. Does he suspect Joey at this point? Yeah, maybe. Maybe at this point. Yeah, they're starting to be something going on but i think he also hates joey i think he's i think it's all mixing in right i don't think it's linear for him like joey is the one that negotiated the deal to have him take the dive joey's been the one with the with that Gennaro fight that bothered him so much joey is the one now here kind of contradicting him in front of his wife like that's like a thing there so maybe that's a line that's crossed for him that he's sensing that joey is taking more license with him than he has in the past. And maybe he's thinking, oh, because he's sleeping with my wife, he can defend her this way. You know, there's all these things that are slamming into his completely warped brain yeah. uh, to maybe start to believe this situation because we're just a few scenes away from it happening. So yeah. yeah, you have to see the seeds somewhere. And this feels possible that the seeds are here already being planted. Well, and I think too, Joey telling her what to eat is part of it. It's yeah, a, right. That's he, part of it too. Is that is an, a, an ownership. Problem. Well, yeah. and I think you know, when you think about what these shots were of Vicky kissing Tommy, mm -hmm. Joey and his wedding ring, because, yeah, yeah. you know, Joey dates other women. He's had, Jake knows that he has affairs. Right. And then Joey is the one that set up, to take, as you said, taking the dive. And that moment of Joey's arm around Tommy. So yeah. all of those images are bouncing around in Jake's head and taking on meaning. Yeah. Um, by the way, Jake had to give the mob $20,000 under the table to get this fight. So he paid the mob $20,000 for the title shot. Then he bet 10 grand on himself at eight to five odds and won, obviously. So <laughs> we're in what's going to be the only steady cam shot in the movie. They, they, they talked about doing a lot of steady cam. Uh, this is, you know, 1979, 1980, which is really the invention of Steadicam. There's a ton of Steadicam in The Shining is one of the other first films to really mm. use it a lot. Right. And for the most part, Scorsese says he didn't like the way it was looking at this time. And so this ends up being the only Steadicam shot in the movie. 
it starts with Jake punching Joey, who's got the big pad around his belly. And it looks like De Niro is punching him perfectly just too hard, if that makes sense. <laughs> and the steady cam moves back with them uh, as they move through the hallway, adjusting the hood as they go down. It's the shot's amazing. Um, this is, in fact, the first shot of the film that Thelma Schoonmaker saw when she started working on the picture. Um, they move into the arena, fans behind them. The shot's amazing. They come down into the arena. And then the end about this shot is just as we talked about in Goodfellas at the um, meat truck where the camera's on a crane and the guy's got a steady cam, and the crane lands down in the meat truck and the guy steps off the crane and walks into the meat truck. This is the opposite. So he falls the, them all the way down the hall into the arena and then he steps onto a crane that gets lifted up. So uh, you know how in movies they say, you, you know, when you're watching a movie about the making of the movie, you'll hear the director say action and you'll hear him say cut, print it, right? Well, yeah. this is what that means for those of you out there who don't know, is that printing film, which means developing from the negative, is expensive. So if you mm -hmm. did eight takes and four of them suck, you don't print the four takes that suck because it costs money. So the good take is the one where you say print it. So the director is talking to the script supervisor, says, this is what I want printed. This is my favorite take. This is my second take. It was very clear what the favorite take was. Said print it. This is the first footage of the film that Thelma has seen. She sees the marked take as the best one. And one of the registers or little pins that the film runs through had shredded this take. Oh, ripped no. Ripped it to pieces. So it didn't work. So this is, in fact, the backup take. <sighs> Um, one more sound thing, which is that we have the sound of the crowd and there's reverb, you know, so the echoing sound that gives you a sense of the space. And this is how you, you do this back in the old, old school way of doing this is that you've got your recording of the space or whatever it is. And you want to add reverb. So you pipe that recording into a little room that has a speaker and a microphone. And in that room are all sorts of different surfaces and they could be metal or wood things that create reverberation. And then you record your sound in that space. And now you have a reverb version of it. So what you end up having when you're doing your mix is you have one fader that has the original sound and you have another fader that has the reverb sound coming from this little echo chamber. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that you can mix, and then you mix the two. So you have some of the original sound. And usually when you're adding reverb, it'll be like 80% original sound, 20% of the reverb. Right. This is 90% the reverb sound. That's why it sounds so odd and surreal as they're moving into the space. It's just the echoes. It's not the actual sound, if that makes sense. Interesting. This is where I would go, like, technically, this movie's off the charts. Amazing. Yeah. So I love that the champ has turned his back into the corner after the they touch gloves. And in the second he turns back around, Jake is all over him. Yeah. And he's on fire. Just destroyed him. Great slow-mo shots of the champ in the corner. Great tilted slow-mo shots of water pouring over Jake's head. Again, yeah. running water is a visual motif. This is, mm -hmm. and it's cleansing and it's really, and, and, cause, and again, this is Jake at his peak. You know, this is him yes. about to win yes. this champion. And as we have this water pouring over Jake, the champs, people in the corner, signal to the ref that he can't continue. Mm -hmm. And they stop the fight. And I love the slow-mo shot of the ref walking over to Jake's corner, revealing him in this moment that we realize that he has become the champ. Yeah. And they announce it. And Jake is sobbing as they put the belt on him. And my guess is that moment means something to you, getting that belt. Well, from Jake, I get, no, I mean, because I don't like him. Oh, so yeah. Him winning the belt is more a validation of his behavior. And so I don't feel positive that Jake has won the belt. It's more a matter of like, oh, fuck, what's next? You know, so. And the way it's done is kind of, how can I say this? Anticlimactic. Hmm. Like all these other fights he's had, whether he's won or lost, have been interesting fights, you know. And so this fight is such a mauling that by the end, the fact that he can't get off the stool, it's anticlimactic. It's not as, as in, uh, an exciting of a win. Like it isn't a knock. It's a technical knockout um, because he can't get off the stool, but it's not a knockout, which would have been a great way to win the title. So, yeah. So, I mean, he wins the title and it's, yeah, 
it's fine he wins the title, but I'm not necessarily like, oh, great. You know, this is a terrible person. You know, it's, I, I, it's I'm going to say a funny, an odd thing, but yeah. I'm so glad that I asked you this question. And I'm so glad that I was completely wrong about what your response was going to be. Because, <laughs> because the thought that hit me just as we were talking yeah. about this is getting a belt. I was like, oh, John got a belt. I know that was an extremely moving <laughs> well, moment. Well, yes. To you, and that was really important moment sure. in your life. And I was like, oh, I wonder if John connects these two things, which obviously you don't. And what you made me realize is you're 100% right about something that I had not consciously thought about. In every other sports movie, when the person wins the title, it is moving. That is the yes. point. It is the moment of accomplishing a life's goal that took discipline and yes. hard work, and it is a cathartic moment of success. And I don't feel any of that here either. I hadn't, th and, but, yeah. and if I hadn't asked you that question and heard your answer, I wouldn't have realized what my feelings were and why they were so different from, you know, a Rocky movie. Yeah, where you're moved, right? Because you see Rocky's life outside of getting to the belt, and it is all full of like. Him coming to terms with his stuff with Mickey, him winning over uh, um, Adrian. So he's a better person, you know, and him walking away from a life of leg breaking, him doubting himself, him just wanting to go the distance. So there's so much that of his journey that a majority of people can connect to. When you look at Jake, Jake's an abusive person, violently abusive, verbally abusive. He's condescending. He's arrogant. He's a prick. He's always judging everyone in his life. He's suspicious of everyone in his life. So when he wins the belt, what should be a triumphant moment in the movie, I think is more um, a harbinger of things to come and a danger that now you've uh, now that you've given the thing he most wants to a person like this, is he become going kind to of become even worse? Because when people win titles, they start to believe that everything they've done has validity because it led them to the championship. And that's the dangerous part of things like this. I, I'm not going to say that this is not a sports movie because obviously it is a sports movie. Totally. Is, yeah. But, but what I am going to say is I'm just thinking through and basically the basic structure of a sports movie is that in every other sports movie, you have an individual or a team that has to overcome great adversity in order yes. to succeed at the end. And even in a movie like Rocky or the Bad News Bears, where they actually mm -hmm. lose, they really win. You know what I mean? They overcome adversity. It's, it's you know, the natural. It's all of them. Right. That right. is what the movie is about. And that is not what this movie is about. This He does overcome adversity and he does win, but that's not what the film's about. No. Right. And so at this moment, which should be a triumph. But we're not feeling like it's a triumph with Jake LaMotta winning the middleweight championship of the world. I think it's a perfect time to end part two of our exploration of Raging Bull. As always, we'd love to hear your comments. You could visit us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for the Cinephiles on Twitter or X. It's Cine underscore files. By the way, I don't, I think X is losing. I think it's going to lose. It's now, I know it's off topic, but it's now, what, <laughs> six months since he renamed it and nobody calls it X. It, it, nobody does. It's, yeah. So anyway, but, but we're sitting on underscore files there. They, they haven't changed the name of Instagram and neither, neither have we. We are still the Cinephiles podcast. If you want to subscribe to the show just to watch it, just to listen to it on Apple Podcasts, you absolutely can. But now we have a paid subscription fee at $4.99 a month or $49.99 a year where you can get ad free versions of the show. And we're going to be adding all the catalog and our shorts to that. If you're not an Apple person, no judgment, no disrespect. You can go on all the other places, YouTube, Spotify, Android, the, all sorts of apps where you can listen to our podcast. Uh, if you want to buy or stream Raging Bull along with every other film we've ever reviewed, you can do so at cinephiles.net. And if you want to support the show at patreon.com slash the cinephiles, where there are even more tiers and more ways to support the show than on Apple Podcasts, that's on patreon.com slash the cinephiles. And if you want to reach me, it's SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. John, how about you? You can always find me at The Roka Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, The Outlaw Nation on Twitch, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roka Says, and my numerous podcasts, uh, The Geek Buddies and The Hot Mic that are out there for you all to enjoy that are their own separate feeds, as well as The Outlaw Nation Podcast Network, where we have stuff like The Jedi Way and my reviews and reactions on there as well. So I think that's it for this week, and we will be back, I think, to conclude Raging Bull next week right yes. here on The Cinephiles. <laughs>